We bought all the chicken sandwiches from every fast food chain in the US and the UK to compare the differences. This is Food Wars. At a UK McDonald's, chicken sandwiches come in three sizes. The mayo chicken, a McChicken sandwich, and a McCrispy. McDonald's in the US has four chicken sandwich options. The McChicken, the McCrispy, the McCrispy Deluxe, and the McCrips, Cripsy, <laughs> and the McCrispy Spicy Deluxe. The UK KFC options are a regular chicken sandwich, a tower burger, which is the same, but with a hash brown and some cheese, and a stacker burger, which is two chicken patties with some cheese as well. KFC options, we currently have two. The Chicken Little, look at this little guy. So little. And the KFC Chicken Sandwich. This is part of their Gourmet Kings range. Whoops. We have two types of chicken sandwich at a UK Burger King. The Chicken Royale, or the Steakhouse Crispy Chicken. Burger King in the US also has two chicken sandwich options and they are as follows. I am taking this off. Uh, the Chicken Junior, this guy. I mean, this looks exactly like a McChicken. And the original chicken sandwich, the only chicken sandwich we're gonna see today that is shaped like a smartphone. Popeye's chicken sandwiches in the UK only come in one size, the classic chicken sandwich. Popeyes in the US also has but one chicken sandwich. Shake Shack in the UK only has one size of chicken burger, the chicken shack. Shake Shack, we haven't done anything with Shake Shack in years it feels like, but they're back, they got a chicken sandwich. Just on looks, whoa, this looks ridiculously good. Jollibee's chicken burgers come in two sizes in the UK, as a standard or as a double. Jollibee, I love Jollibee and their chicken sandwiches are very good. We have their regular chicken sandwich, and the spicy. Wendy's in the US went all in on chicken sandwiches. As you can see, there are nine varieties, two, four, six, yeah. Wendy's only has one size of chicken sandwich in the UK. Okay, um, I'm sorry, what sandwich is it again? And the crispy chicken sandwich, chicken BLT. It's okay, okay, okay. Asiago Club, spicy chicken sandwich, Wendy's, all right, we get it. BLT or club? Spicy ghost pepper, bacon, pretzel, pub. Wendy's spicy pretzel. Then we've got some options that you won't find in the US. Two things from a chain called Morley's, a strip burger and a fillet burger, and one thing from Nando's, the grilled chicken burger. Arby's, which is only available in the US, has three chicken sandwiches starting over here. They have their crispy chicken sandwich, they have their bacon Swiss crispy chicken sandwich, and they got the buffalo chicken sandwich. Chick-fil-A, of course, the original. You can also get the same sandwich, spicy version. Raising Cane's, they have, of course, one chicken sandwich option on the menu. This is that. Uh, depending where you are in the United States, these are the five Carl's Jr. slash Hardee's chicken sandwiches. So here are almost all of the chicken burgers you'll find in the UK arranged by price. The cheapest at this end is the McDonald's Mayo Chicken at just £1.19. The most expensive is the Shake Shack Chicken Shack, coming in at £9.35. For the price of one Shake Shack Chicken Shack, you could buy 7.8 McDonald's Mayo Chickens. In general, I think it seems like the size is tracking with the price, so they do seem a little bit smaller down this end and a little bit bigger down this end, with a couple of exceptions. I do think the Nando's one looks a little bit small, even the Chicken Shack does look a bit small, and that's very expensive. Okay, prices in the US. Uh, starting from least expensive to most expensive. The least expensive sandwich, to no surprise, is the KFC Chicken Little, which comes in at $2.39. But let's be honest, this isn't actually a full sandwich. I mean, it's almost like a little slider. The most expensive is the Carl's Jr. Bacon Swiss Chicken Sandwich. Coming in, just the sandwich, $11.49. You know, I think it's interesting that McDonald's takes up this part. Wendy's is almost all exactly right here. Arby's is almost exactly right over here. I do enjoy Raising Cane's, but this sandwich should not be in this percentage of price. Um, first of all, it's chicken tender sandwiches. It's not even like a full chicken patty. I mean, the Jolly Bee spicy and regular are, you know, in the lower third. This is a great sandwich. Popeye's is here. 
KFC is right here. Popeyes and KFC positioned almost right next to each other. Price. A lot of people, myself included, would say this might be, these might be the best fast food crispy chicken sandwiches on the market. And they're down here, man. They're like hovering around McChicken prices. Here are all the UK chicken sandwiches ordered by weight. The lightest option is the mayo chicken at 120 grams. And the heaviest is the KFC Zinger Stacker Burger at 325 grams. Key takeaways there, a few of them really dropped down. For example, the Shake Shack Burger, the Nando's Burger has really plummeted in terms of price versus weight. Not a lot of movement at the bottom end of the table, which is interesting. I think even just visually, like the colors are quite interesting. Down the mayo chicken end, the buns are kind of very dull, quite a matte finish. Then the sesame seeds kind of start to disappear the higher up you go and you head more towards the kind of brioche bun, which just looks a little bit fancy here in China. Okay, now this is all the US sandwiches by weight. Least weight down here, most weight down there. Okay, once again, the Chicken Little and the Wendy's Crispy Chicken is at the very end of the smallest. Then all the way down here at the end, the Wendy's Classic Pretzel Bacon Pub at a hefty 284 grams on this one. Heavy sandwich. I, mean, I don't know what you want to do with this information, really. The one thing I will notice is the most expensive one, or the one of the most expensive ones, is the weight right in the middle. So certainly not charging by volume. Shame on you, Carl's Jr. Popeyes, right? Popeyes is over here. Move this way all the way up, so lesser in price, more in weight. Let's go. And here are all the chicken sandwiches arranged in order of price by weight. So the best value in terms of price by weight is the McDonald's mayo chicken. Per 100 grams of burger, that will cost you just 99p. The most expensive by weight is the Shake Shack Chicken Shack. Per 100 grams of burger, that one will cost you £4.25. The Shake Shack burger is 329% more expensive than the mayo chicken. I guess ultimately it comes down to personal preference as to whether you want to pay a little bit more for what you would hope to be higher quality, or if you kind of just want value for money and quantity over quality. I think when it comes to fast food, I kind of just want value for money. I just want to leave feeling satisfied with my food for as little price as possible. I'm kind of surprised how low down in the value scale the Chicken Royale from Burger King and the standard Philip Burger from KFC ended up. You're really not getting that much value for money when compared to some of these options, and I don't think the quality of either of those chains is necessarily high enough to justify that price point. For example, I think the Jollibee Double Chicken Sandwich as well as the Zinger Stacker Burger, you're getting a lot of food for your money there. And honestly, these are really tasty burgers, so the quality is good, price is good. I think these ones are what I would lean towards in general if I were to order. This, this is an order from best value to worst value. Coming in at <laughs> is a Wendy's BLT. Look at this little guy. What a deal. I love the fact that both the Popeyes and the KFC chicken sandwiches are arguably the best deal you can get in the US. I mean, look at this. If you're going per 100 grams, the Chicken Little isn't as good of a deal as a full chicken sandwich. I love it. Um, glad to see the pretzel buns are down here because these were the heaviest, but also comparing it with the price, you get a pretty good deal. I think from here on, it's like, yeah, okay. Um, back here, Jollibee Spicy Chicken. Glad to see it, great deal. McChicken's over here, huh? Raisin Cane's, all right. I was a little tough on Raisin Cane's before. Everyone's favorite, Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A here and here, really? Really, this is your favorite restaurant? We're closed on Sundays for this? Give me a break. Shake Shack's over here. I don't know. I was enticed by its size. But I have to run in the numbers. It's not that good of a deal. Shame on you, Shake Shack. I know, McDonald's, even McDonald's isn't safe. They're McCrispy all the way over here for this one? That's surprising and annoying. Look at this, look at this. Every Carl's Jr. Most expensive, right? They weren't the heaviest. Worst value. The Carl's Jr. hand breaded. Not even the ones with all the fun stuff on it. Just a regular hand breaded sandwich. Here you go. It was $10.99 and it weighed 221 grams. So it's $4.97 per 100 grams. I know it's a lot of data to throw at you. Let me just give you the TLDR. Too expensive. So here are all the UK's standard chicken sandwiches. I'm gonna taste them all back to back and provide you with my definitive ranking. Here are the standard chicken sandwiches at several US fast food chains. I'm gonna try and rank them right now. McDonald's McCrispy. Let's give this one a try. They've gone really heavy on the mayo. The bun is quite fancy. It's fancier than you'd normally find on a McDonald's burger. It's kind of like a pretzel bun effect. Nice, shiny, 
decent texture on it, not too doughy. Chicken patty, maybe a little bit thin. It's a good place to start because I think there is room for improvement there, but it could be a lot worse. So starting well down here, the McChicken classic. I mean, I feel like I'm a bit biased because I've been eating these as long as I can remember. I'll put it here for now. I feel like, I mean, it's good for its value, but I don't know, a little basic. Now, I don't think I've had this one before, the Burger King one. Hmm. Hmm. Similar, I actually like that better. Yeah, BK, all right. Next up, we've got the KFC Phillip Burger. By the looks of things, also just mayo and lettuce and chicken. Overall, it's just lacking a little bit of something. It's quite bland. I think so far, whether it's the chicken, the breading, or the mayo, not quite as flavorful as the McCrispy, so slightly below it. I mean, come on. Popeye's chicken sandwich. This has been sitting for a while. This is the one that everyone lost their minds about on the internet, so. Everything I'm looking for. Still crispy, amazing Popeye's flavor. Love the bun. Little bit of mayo or sauce on there. Not too overpowering. Wow, that's great. That'll, that'll, that'll stay in this region. Big competitor though, KFC. Ooh, and this one, this is still really crispy. All right. You heard that crunch? Yeah. I'm going in for another bite. The Burger King Chicken Royale. I'm tempted to dock points just because of how stupid this thing looks. I've never understood why they made it long. I think the ratio is slightly off. The bun is obviously a long bun, but it's also quite thick. So if you can see there, you're getting like quite a lot of bread to meat ratio. And yeah, that's the worst one so far. Um, Wendy's we saw, we'll see later, but Wendy's had, you know, a hundred friggin' sandwiches. Mm, mm -mm. Dry, barely seasoned. No, that's that's a, that's that's the worst one. What's the cheese on this? No, no, not very good. Popeyes chicken sandwich. Popeyes is a relatively recent addition to the UK. We didn't have this until maybe a year or two ago, and I will say, so far people seem to be liking it. On this one, you get the chicken, the mayo, and instead of the lettuce you get pickles, which I think is more of an American thing. And one that I enjoy because I love pickles. This is good. I think we have a leader so far. The chicken, I would say is thicker and crispier than any of the three I've tried so far. Get little like crunchy bits that flake off the edge. Mm. So yeah, I think my favorite so far, Popeyes. Arby's, I mean, they got the meats, and I guess chicken's a meat, but I don't think about getting chicken when I go to Arby's. It's roast beef, right? But no, I'm like flavorless, you know? Shake Shack Chicken Shack is up next. This is the most expensive of any of the burgers we've tried today. It looks pretty fancy. The bun is that classic Shake Shack bun. I think it's a potato roll. We have chicken, mayo, and lettuce. No pickles in this one. I was wrong. There are pickles in this one. The breading on the chicken, it looked like it was gonna be tasty, but in actuality doesn't have that much flavor. And if you actually look at the chicken, it's quite a thick piece of chicken, but it's like very dry and quite tough. I think it's probably worse than the McSpicy, so I'm gonna tuck it in there. Here we go. Let's get everyone fighting in the comments with Chick-fil-A. Never been a Chick-fil-A fan, and I hope everyone watching can see what varieties of chicken sandwiches you can get at any fast food chain. Why are you picking this? What are you doing? What are you guys doing? I've never really cared for Chick-fil-A. It's just the epitome of fine. I mean, this is looking closer to, to these ones than it is to these over here. Looks really dry. Gotta get the sauce, gotta put sauce on it. So I got Chick-fil-A sauce. But I mean, the fact that it's like, no, you have to put sauce on it to enjoy it. Well, then, okay, then put the sauce on it. Why do I gotta do it? And I do really like the Chick-fil-A sauce. It's a very good sauce. I will say, what this has going for it, other than these, is that its simplicity makes it, to me, 
a little better because it's not bogged down with like a lot of like soggy vegetables or, or sauce or whatever. And when you add, in this instance, the Chick-fil-A sauce, it is better. So for that, I'm gonna put it, let me put it down here. It's definitely not as good as a McChicken. Um, I just don't see what the big deal is. I don't. And everyone's gonna flood my comments with uh, the specialty orders I have to get with the sauces and then no. This is the sandwich, it's on the menu, I got it. I tasted it, boring and bland. Up next we got Jollibee, their classic chicken sandwich. Also a relatively new addition to the UK. Let's give it a try. Mm. Wow. I think it's the crispiest chicken we've had so far. I think it's even crispier than the Popeyes one. Could maybe benefit from a little bit more mayo. It's just slightly dry is my main criticism so far. There's not much to separate this from Popeyes, but I think I slightly prefer the taste of Popeyes. So I'll tuck it in there. Yo, Raising Cane's though. Chicken tender sandwiches. Someone's head chef is a 12 year old boy. Um, not a bad idea. Just stick the tenders in a bun, throw some sauce on here. Let's go. Mmm, cool. Mmm. Here's why this is smart. With the tenders, there's more surface, there's more like surface space. So the crispy skin to chicken ratio leans more towards the crispy chicken, or the crispy skin, which makes it, just gives it a lot more flavor. Mm -hmm. I really like Raisin Cane's. I know I was disappointed when put in the value matrix that uh, Harry came up with, but you don't want to discount taste. It is a very tasty chicken sandwich, so. Oh, Raisin Cane's another one that's famous for having like this cane sauce you're supposed to dip it in, and I didn't even put any on here. It's still good, so Chick-fil-A, yeah, extra sauce. Then we're on to the Wendy's classic chicken sandwich. What well, looks like quite a dry bun, chicken patty, lettuce, Ooh, tomato and pickles. Just visually, I had quite low expectations, but that's a pretty tasty sandwich. Not bad, I'm gonna put it slightly below the McCrispy. All right, last two. Uh, Shake Shack is great. I don't usually go there that often because I always feel like it's a little bit more on the expensive side. And aesthetics alone, this looks like it would have been maybe the best one. It looks like a big piece of chicken. Yeah, good amount of sauce. I like the, the bun. This, this looks like a big chicken sandwich, right? This is really good. Yeah. The flavor of that chicken is Popeyes and KFC level. I mean, it. Cane's is cool. Everything this way has more of a generic fried chicken flavor, but from here on, the flavors are getting more specific, which I like. And Shake Shack's, wow. Then we've got two UK exclusives to rank as well. I'm gonna start with the Morley's Fillet Burger. This kind of looks like the platonic ideal chicken burger that you might find. Just the lettuce, quite a lot of mayo. Chicken looks good. Not the thickest piece of chicken, but looks pretty well seasoned. The chicken, I would describe the texture as leathery. Quality wise, you can kind of tell that the chicken in here is maybe not quite as good as some of the other ones. I think it's down here actually. Not as bad as the long chicken. And last, what we've determined, arguably the worst value for your money, Carl's Jr. Oh man. But they're really emphasizing that this is a hand bread it. They're doing it by hand back there. Let's see how it tastes. Hello. <laughs> this is actually pretty good. Oh man, I've been dogging on Carl's Jr. all day. Okay. Raisin cane is just better than this one, but not, I mean, it's close. This one has a, uh, they both have a, a unique flavor. Cane's overall has a better lasting flavor. They don't taste exactly the same, but Carl's Jr., your hand-breaded chicken sandwich is actually pretty good. Then our final option is the Nando's Grilled Chicken Burger. 
It's some of their signature grilled chicken with your chosen spice level. Leon chose the spiciest one for me, thank you. And it's served on these kind of, uh, I think it's a Portuguese roll, which have quite a firm texture to them. I will say you can taste the quality of the chicken with this one. The ratio is slightly off. I've always thought this bun is like quite a lot for the rest of the ingredients. It's good, but where does it rank? I think this may upset people, but I'm actually gonna put it slightly below the McCrispy. And that is my ranking. Coming in dead last, Burger King Chicken Royale. And I think my favorite is the Popeye's Chicken Sandwich. Going down the ranking, ranking from least to best, says me. In last place we have, was this Wendy's? Yeah, but of course, the top two, Popeyes and KFC. And I wanna say, at any given day, it could be Popeyes one, KFC two. Those guys are neck and neck, um, depending on the KFC and Popeyes you go to. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot, Jollibee. This is the standard Jollibee sandwich. I'll put that between the mixed chicken and the um, Chick-fil-A. Yeah, not, not impressed. A lot of chicken to keep track of. Now I'm gonna talk about all the US sandwiches you cannot get in the UK. Here are all the chicken sandwiches from the UK that you won't find in the US. Only we call them chicken burgers. Firstly is the return of the value king. It's the mayo chicken. This is as simple, cheap and cheerful as it gets. It's a slightly oddly shaped, usually square chicken patty with some mayo and some lettuce on a bun. And for a few extra pence, you can also add bacon and have a bacon mayo chicken. Then we have a linguistic difference. In the UK, our spicy version of the chicken sandwich is called a McSpicy. You guys call yours a spicy McCrispy, which to me seems like an unnecessary amount of words. Whatever. I like spicy McCrispy, it's like a pirate name. <laughs> <laughs> Then we're on to KFC. In the UK, instead of having a spicy chicken sandwich, we have a Zinger burger. It's basically the same thing, same patty, but the breading is a bit more spicy. I quite like this. I think, generally speaking, I'll opt for a Zinger burger over just the classic fillet burger. Also, do Americans find it weird that we pronounce it fillet burger and not fillet? Because uh, I feel like you guys will find that weird. Unless you're talking about the fillet o fish from McDonald's, in which case we say fillet. Figure it out. Our next exclusive from KFC in the UK is the Tower Burger. So this is the chicken, but then they add some cheese to it and a hash brown. We've also gone for the Zinger Tower Burger here, which means that you get this spicy salsa sauce on top as well. And then we have the exclusive Zinger Stacker Burger. Now this is our largest burger that you can find on a KFC UK menu. And it's, if I can separate them, <laughs> which apparently I can't, <laughs> it's just peeled instead. It's two chicken patties with cheese between and on top, lettuce, spicy mayo, and some more spicy sauce on top as well. While we're talking about the KFC ones, you'll note that on the UK menu, they're all named a burger rather than a sandwich. It's hard to explain exactly where the linguistic difference comes from. I think a lot of it comes to do with the bread that your sandwich comes in. I think generally speaking, if you have like a round bun, particularly with sesame seeds on it in the UK, what's inside it is just gonna be called a burger. We actually have quite a few chicken exclusives on a UK Burger King menu. We'll start with this one, which is the Steakhouse Crispy Chicken. This is part of their Gourmet Kings menu. That's how I describe myself. There's a tomato sauce on the bottom, a crispy chicken patty, big slice of cheese, bacon, and then what looks to be some rocket on top. For the American audience, we call arugula rocket. I've not had this one before. It was quite expensive. I think it's got gourmet in the name, and I think they're using that to uh, put this at quite a high price point. It's not bad. I do think to get this as part of a meal, you're like pushing 10 pounds in the UK. And I feel like once you've hit that price point, just go somewhere else, just go to a restaurant because you'll get like better quality, fresher food for probably the same, if not even less money. There's a linguistic difference to point out, which is that in the UK, we call our weird long Burger King chicken burger a chicken royale. In the UK, we can also get our chicken royale with bacon and cheese. Or we can get a Californian barbecue royale. So that is the standard royale 
with the chicken, the lettuce and the mayo, but also quite a lot of barbecue sauce and also some tomato on there. Surprisingly, we actually have a couple of Popeyes exclusive sandwiches that you don't have in the US. Here we have the deluxe chicken sandwich and the spicy deluxe chicken sandwich. Now, while a regular Popeye sandwich is just sauce, chicken and pickles, these ones have sauce, chicken, pickles, but also lettuce and cheese. With the standard one, the sauce is mayo. And on the spicy one, it's actually the sauce that changes rather than the chicken. This one having a spicy mayo instead. I don't know if adding a little bit of lettuce and cheese to something is enough to qualify it as deluxe. I think if you're calling something deluxe, I'm gonna need a little bit more than that, guys. But I'll give it a try. You know what? I'm gonna say it. I think the deluxe sandwiches are worse than the originals from Popeyes. I think for that couple of extra pounds that it's costing you to add a little bit of cheese and lettuce to your sandwich, you're better off without it, honestly. The next exclusive was actually a bit surprising to me. It's this one from Jollibee, the double chicken sandwich. It's surprising in the sense that the UK is the country of excess here for once. We're the ones with the much larger portion. This is a hefty, hefty sandwich. We have one exclusive chicken sandwich from the UK Wendy's, which is the Avocado Chicken Club. So you get the chicken patty with some cheese on top, and then you have some mashed avocado, bacon, lettuce, and tomato. Not to be outdone, the UK also has quite a few chicken chains that you won't find in the US. And interestingly, our chicken sandwich culture is quite different to yours. Now in terms of chains, Nando's is obviously a pretty iconic chicken joint over here in the UK. Now while you can find some of these on the east coast of the US, over here they're in pretty much every city and town and are kind of like a foundational part of UK culture at this point. We're now so obsessed with Peri Peri as a flavour that almost every restaurant that sells chicken will have a Peri Peri option and you've seen lots of other chains try and spring up to capitalise on the popularity, like Roosters and Pepe's. Now we can't talk about British chicken sandwiches without talking about chicken shops. Chicken shops are an integral part of UK and more specifically London culture. The big players are Morley's and Chicken Cottage, but there are literally thousands of independent ones scattered across the UK. They're so popular that people are ripping off the big chains now. So you'll see things like Monley's and Moley's opening up with deceptively similar branding and decor to the classic Morley's chain. To put into context just how popular chicken shops are, there are currently around 8,000 of them in London. McDonald's has just 200 locations. A funny thing is how some of the independent chicken shops aren't just ripping off other ones like Morley's, but they're trying to rip off the big chains like KFC. I think in the UK, people don't really understand what fried chicken means when you refer it to a specific US state. So I'm sure to Americans, they will know the difference between Kentucky fried chicken versus something that was fried elsewhere. But in the UK, we don't really have that context. In the UK, you might walk down the street and see Ohio fried chicken, Maryland fried chicken, or Alaska fried chicken. Uh, as an American, yes, Kentucky does have a distinct type of fried chicken. Um, Popeyes is Louisiana. Other southern states have their own ways of making fried chicken. Yeah, Nashville hot fried chicken. That's another one, which is a city, not a state. Yes, I realize. But yeah, Alaska, no. Ohio, no. Montana, no, no. Montana has no cuisine. Another thing to point out is that when it comes to the big chains like Morley's and Chicken Cottage, the individual shops are often franchised. Leon swears by the Thornton Heath Morley's. He's a South London guy and he says that's the best one. If you've been to a better one, let us know. There isn't a better one. <laughs> now I'm gonna talk about all the US sandwiches you cannot get in the UK. Uh, gonna go by chain. So McDonald's, for instance, you can get a deluxe crispy chicken sandwich, which is just the regular chicken sandwich with lettuce and tomato and mayo on it. Um, and then you can also get the spicy version. See, the sauce is a little bit oranger, which I guess it makes it spicier. Burger King, I saw it in there. Your, what was it your, you guys called this? The, the, the Burger Royale? And ours is just the original crispy chicken sandwich. Sub sandwich, it's shaped like that for seemingly no specific reason. Yep, KFC. The chicken little, well, that's a little guy. You can also get your Chick-fil-A sandwich, spicy version um, that looks spicier. It comes in a red bag, because uh, red is hot and spicy is hot. I mean, everything that Carl's Jr. was a uh, exclusive, I think, because you guys don't even have one. It just seems like we're kind of just throwing everything at the wall and see what sticks, crispy chicken with bacon. I feel that Wendy's especially, Wendy's and Carl's Jr., they just are trying to like, do variations on a theme. 
hoping that we'll kind of get everyone. I understand why, but it's a bit overwhelmed, right? I mean, I don't even know which one to get. I don't want to. I don't want to bite any of these. These all look bad. This whole section here is just like throw everything in the wall and see what sticks. I don't. I don't agree with that strategy, guys. Just by the looks of all these sandwiches, the flagship chicken sandwich at each one of the chains, I would more go for than any of these. I'm just. I don't want any of these. From exclusive items to portion sizes, we wanted to find out all the differences between IKEA food in the US and the UK. This is Food Wars. Quick note, it turns out IKEA does not offer a takeout option, but fortunately they do sell lots of Tupperware containers. So in case you're wondering why the food looks a little bit sad, it's because we had to improvise. On with the video. Let's start portion sizes with IKEA's claim to fame when it comes to food, the Swedish meatballs. In the US, IKEA's restaurant offer only one portion size for meatballs, eight pieces. But after that, you can get them in increments of four. For instance, 12 meatballs. In the UK, IKEA's iconic meatballs come in two portion sizes, eight or 12. You can also add four extra meatballs to any order for an extra £1.75, and there's seemingly no limit to how many times you can do this. In the UK, the meatballs come with either mashed potatoes or chips on the side, as well as some garden peas, lingonberry jam, and of course, their famous gravy. And of course, the meatball options all come with a side of mashed potatoes and peas. Let's get a load of that. Also a little bit of cranberry sauce. We're gonna weigh eight meatballs in both countries to see whose meatballs are bigger. One, two, Let's also try and weigh our mash. Now I do feel like the uh, stats might be skewed slightly because there's some peas embedded in this. I will try and free it where I can. We got way more mash than the UK, like almost double. <laughs> They're feeding us at our IKEAs. Vegans and vegetarians rejoice. IKEA also offers vegetarian and vegan versions of its meatballs right here. We're doing a blind taste test, plant versus meat. That's definitely plant, plant based. What's the next one? Oh, was that wrong? Wait, okay, well, give me the other one. Okay, this is the other one? Yeah, it's me. Not even close. Not even close. Thank you, Peter. Neither were bad, and if I was a vegetarian or vegan, I would be perfectly happy with those plant foods. It tasted perfectly fine, but that the, the, the difference is noticeable. We share a couple of dessert options with the US, notably the dime cake. Over here, we call that the caramel almond cake. Let's weigh a slice. Another dessert option we share with the UK is a soft serve ice cream, which you get in vanilla or strawberry. Okay, first of all, the gentleman who worked there was adamant that it's actually frozen yogurt. I don't know if that's true or not. Regardless, they didn't have to-go cups like Harry was able to get. So all they would give us is like the small cup where it's kind of poking out, like it's ready to eat. It is 97 degrees in Los Angeles today. There's absolutely no way that was making it from Ikea to the car, let alone the studio. So here's footage of me enjoying it in the lobby of Ikea. So I'm sorry, I didn't bring the scale. I don't know how much it weighs. We have soft serve ice cream in the UK too, either as vanilla or vanilla with chocolate sauce. Impressively, they've given us exactly 100 grams of soft serve ice cream. IKEA is also known for its hot dogs. In the UK, you can get either a classic hot dog or a veggie hot dog from the bistro stand. We're gonna measure and weigh the classic hot dog to compare with the US. The hot dog in the UK is seven inches in length, and with the toppings of pickles and onions, it weighs 114 grams. Hot dog. Our hot dog is five and a quarter inches long. And our hot dog weighs 75 grams. Here are all the menu items from a UK IKEA that you won't find in the US. Here's all the food you'll find in a US IKEA you won't find in the UK. Starting out down here, hot entrees. This single piece of chicken is the Havana chicken. Now it doesn't come alone. It comes with plantains, rice, and beans, which we will see in a little bit. But just isolated the chicken. It's been sitting for a minute, sorry. Havana chicken, I wonder what makes it so Havana. Yeah, I'm definitely getting some spices in here. Very flavorful. 
not just like a standard piece of chicken. It's actually really good. We'll start down this end with some main courses. We have two different non-meat meatball options in the UK. Firstly, we have the veggie balls. These are meatballs which are formed of ground up vegetables and they're also served with a vegetable couscous as well. But for vegetarians who prefer something a bit more reminiscent of meat, they also have plant balls. Now I'm kind of intrigued by these because they look really good. These are a fake meat version of Ikea's classic meatballs. Now compared to a classic meatball, they're actually like almost more visually appealing, I would say. They're a nice dark golden brown color. They look like they've, you know, been cooked in a similar way, maybe even kind of like fried or cooked but longer than you would expect from these. Let's do a very quick taste test. Classic meatball. We all know and love it. These things are delicious. And then one of the plant balls. I will say the plant-based one doesn't have that distinct IKEA meatball taste to it. That said, still pretty tasty. I think texture-wise, it's like almost identical to the classic meatball. You can also get a salmon filet with pea pesto, vegetable medallions, and a corn medley, which you can see right here. I mean, salmon's okay, I guess. Okay. It, it, this isn't, it's, it's been sitting for a while. If you like salmon, sure. I don't know, you go to Ikea and get salmon? Pea pesto's interesting though. Still in the mood for fish. Before you go furniture shopping, you can also get the garlic lemon cod with, of course, mashed potatoes and peas. Actually, that's a pretty good piece of fish. You actually really like that. Okay. I stand corrected. I was dissing, I was dissing the fish. That's actually, actually pretty good. We have a British classic dish, and that's fish and chips. Now, the fish they serve at IKEA in the UK is pollock. It comes with chips, peas, and some tartar sauce. Now, unlike fish and chips that you might find from a classic chippy in the UK, they've actually breaded their fish rather than battered and then fried it. I generally prefer the battered fish texture. I like the kind of crispy crunch on the outside that you get from batter. I'm gonna have a little, little try of this. It's very weird tasting things on Food Wars using a knife and fork. I don't like it. I respect that they have attempted to localize their menu to the UK market, but maybe uh, put a bit more thought into your R&D there. If you want to see what proper fish and chips looks like, go and check out our uh, Food Tours Best Fish and Chips in London video. Next up, we have another fish option. It's a salmon fillet. Fillet. Right. Come on. <laughs> Next up, we have another fish option. It's a salmon fillet. In the UK, we generally lean more towards fillet as the uh, wording. And also we spell it slightly differently. Often we spell it with two L's, whereas I believe in the US it tends to be spelled with one. I think you can get a salmon fillet in the US. However, like we say, we pronounce ours slightly differently. And also in the UK, ours comes with the veggie couscous. Chicken tenders, and they cook. Kind of fries and broccoli. Hmm. Wait, these tenders are actually very good. Like the breading, they're really breaded. Decent fries, hearty. IKEA also has a few things on the menu that were not available at the one we went to. A chicken thigh with garlic chipotle sauce, broccoli and rice, it sounds actually pretty good. Lingonberry barbecue ribs with mac and cheese. Ah, oh, I was so mad they didn't have those. And a plant-based burger with fries, also not available at time of filming this. Now lingonberries are majorly popular in Swedish cuisine and you're gonna see them pop up a few more times in the IKEA menu. Next up is penne pasta with tomato sauce. Penne of course refers to the shape of pasta that they use here in IKEA. Charlie's love it's that. Really it's actually the only analysis you're going to get. What does penne mean? Penne refers to the shapes. It's a strange way of describing <laughs> the pasta shape. I think penne is maybe my least favorite pasta shape. I do not respect penne. Moving swiftly on from the penne, we have a chicken katsu curry. I think this is like a relatively new addition to the UK IKEA menu. So katsu refers to the chicken katsu fillet, which is a breaded and fried piece of chicken. And then it's served with rice and katsu sauce. I've not tried this before. That looks like one just massive piece of chicken, you know? Oh, why are you eating it? Mm. Science. Other than a couple of like slightly disconcerting dark patches inside the chicken breast, it's actually not bad. I think because of the size of the breast, it's dried out quite a lot. But the katsu sauce is really nice. I like it with the rice. I think particularly if we're eating this hot, this actually would be pretty good. Next up on the UK menu, you can find a potato and cauliflower Rogan Josh curry. A Rogan Josh is a curry that you'll find on the menu of a lot of UK curry houses. It's not super spicy, generally quite mild. I'd say traditionally you would see this made with lamb, but they've made a vegetarian version here, obviously with potato and cauliflower as the main bulk of it. The Rogan Josh from Ikea is served with rice, and then you can also get some side options which are designed to go with it, including some pakoras, samosas, and a garlic naan. Obviously the UK has a large British Indian population, so I do think this is another attempt to kind of localize the menu. 
that's pretty good. That's pretty flavorful. There are some other main course options from UK IKEAs, which unfortunately we couldn't find today. These include such things as butternut squash and sweet potato soup, mangalore chicken curry, butternut squash blue cheese and caramelized onion pie, chili sin carne, garlic butter chicken pie, and leek and potato soup. I would like to move on to sides. Right here we have the vegetable medallions. I like veggies presented like this, just like in a little puck, just bite into it. Looks like it has some broccoli, mostly potato friendly. A little onion. Yeah, not bad. Decent side. It's like, you know, it's like broccoli potatoes, like uh, broccoli mashed potatoes. The Havana chicken that I mentioned earlier, this is the beans and rice it comes with. I don't know if they mix them up or just got mixed up in transit, but no, beans and rice, let's go. This is just white, white rice and black beans. Like I don't taste any additional flavor to this at all. They do sometimes offer plantains. Again, the Ikea we went to today did not have plantains, but they did have a garlic bread. I think that's an exclusive. On to the Ikea cold dishes. They have a uh, veggie dog. Well, the veggie dog wrap is under the cold dishes according to script. And this veggie dog is cold. Maybe it's been sitting a while. Either way, it's not very good. Also, they have a Greek salad. Also the Caesar salad, which once again, I mean, this is a pretty low effort. A Stockholm salad. Uh, not to be confused with Stockholm syndrome, which I'm starting to feel right now eating this food. Salmon, lettuce, lemon. Sure. That's, that's, that's not bad, actually. I like this sauce that's turning color under these lights and this salmon. We're not quite sure what is in this salad with the sauces right now, but through the miracle of editing, we can put that on the screen, right? And that's what it is. Tastes pretty good. Also, you can get a BLT chicken wrap. Not bad. If you like wraps and BLT and chicken, also at a US IKEA, which was not available at the time of filming this at our Burbank IKEA, is a Greek veggie ball wrap and marinated salmon. The UK's cold plate menu is pretty bland in comparison. The only one they had today was this marinated salmon plate, but we can also get an egg and shrimp sandwich with mayo, marinated salmon wrap, small salad bowl, and a tomato and mozzarella salad. I guess I'll give the salmon a quick try. I do like smoked salmon. Here, of course, they call it gravlax because it's the traditional Swedish way, and it comes with a dill sauce and some lemon. Fairly mild flavor. I like the kind of herb crusting that you get. The dill sauce is pretty dilly. And now on to desserts. There are three exclusive Ikea US desserts. I was only able to get one of them. So the first would be the strawberry shortcake, not available time of shooting this. The second is this, the caramel almond cake. And the third is the infamous chocolate layered cake, also known as the conspiracy cake. I asked everyone there, please tell me you have chocolate cake. And they all said, no, no chocolate cake at the Burbank Ikea today at least. Tragically, we don't have the conspiracy cake here in the UK, but we do have some other exclusive dessert options. For example, this delightful looking strawberry tart. There's some real pieces of strawberry in there. I like the pastry, I like the cream, I like the fresh strawberries. Whatever the kind of strawberry syrup jelly stuff that they've kind of put around the outside is, it's okay, but it has like a slightly, almost like medicinal quality to it that I don't really love. It almost reminds me of uh, Calpol. I don't know if you have that in the US, but it's like a medicine that's marketed towards children in the UK. Next up, we have Ikea's famous dime cake. Now you do have this on the menu in the US. However, I believe you guys call it something slightly different. I think caramel almond cake. Is dime not a particularly big brand name in the US? Because over here in the UK, I'd say most people are familiar with dime as a chocolate brand. Uh, Harry was just talking a minute ago about the dime cake, the DM cake, D-A-A-M cake. I've never heard of it. I've never heard of that brand. I have no idea what it is. I'm sorry, but we do have this, which I think is supposed to be similar. Oh yeah, this is fantastic. I'm gonna get one of these every time I go. I'm gonna get one of these and I'm gonna get the chocolate cake. I'm gonna be a lookout for it now. It's maybe not quite as popular in the UK as it used to be. It reminds me of my granddad a lot because he used to really love a dime bar. I wouldn't see many people my age going for it, but still very tasty if you're in the mood for it. And this cake is sensational. You get these layers of chocolate, this kind of biscuity crumb, and these kind of like, I thought almost pancakes in the middle. I think these dividing lines might all almost be kind of cold, chilled pancakes. This might be my favorite thing on the menu. This is why I'm making excuses to go to Ikea. Hmm. They did have these at the register. And this also says 
dime on it. Let me see that. Yeah, okay. This tastes like this. Never heard of this, but it's very good. And this is fantastic. I uh, Maybe they just rebranded it because no one in the US knows what d dime cake dime cake is. Our next dessert option is a cheesecake with blueberries and raspberries. It's a very soft cheesecake, really like easy to cut. There's like a nice baked crumb on top. There's a layer of the berry stuff. So there's some blueberries in there, some raspberries. Then finally, we have these under the sea Rocky Road biscuits. Obviously Rocky Road in the UK is a dessert, which is usually like a no-bake dessert made of things like melted chocolate, golden syrup, marshmallows, even things like cornflakes, pieces of biscuit, that sort of thing, all just kind of mixed together, left to set, and then you have a nice, easy dessert. It turns out what makes this under the sea is that they have a kind of animal stamp in icing on top of it. Here we have this nice octopus, and here we have a couple of dolphins. I think when I eat a Rocky Road, I kind of want some more distinct elements. I like being able to bite into it and crunch through a bit of biscuit or chew through a raisin or something. Whereas with this one, it's kind of all blended together. So you don't really get the like texture contrast. The flavor is very much there. It's still all those elements that I'm used to in terms of the flavor. You may also be able to find some other dessert options on a UK menu, which we couldn't find today. These include things like a caramelized biscuit cheesecake, a chocolate clementine bomb, an elderflower and lemon cake, a gooey chocolatey cake, a lemon cheesecake, rhubarb and custard cake, and a strawberry jelly. Aside from its restaurant, IKEA also has the Swedish Bistro for quick bites. The Bistro serves quick bites like hot dogs and pizza slices that you can generally grab on your way out of the store. A few exclusives we had, of course, was pizza slice. There it is. I went with cheese. Is this, is this like Costco where, like, surprise, IKEA has amazing pizza? This is a really good slice of pizza. I can't tell, but I think this was uh, oven cooked fire oven cook, not just like the pizza. This has like a, yeah, like a brick oven. It's not as good as Costco, but it's pretty good. Wow, weird. Ikea's got good pizza. Good on you, Ikea. You can also get this giant bistro pretzel. Look at all. I had like a little braid here. Look at me, I'm a Jedi. But you are not a Jedi yet. And it comes with mustard. They didn't have the mustard either, man. I don't know. Is it because I went at 1030 in the morning and the stuff hadn't shown up yet? They didn't have anything. Pretzel with no mustard. No, oh, no. You guys get some something. Also, the US IKEA Bistro, you can get a marinated salmon baguette. They didn't have it. We have a few exclusive bistro options of our own in the UK. Firstly, if you like the onions on the hot dog, you can just get a side of fried onions. Next up, we have these, which are chickless strips. So these are a plant based version of a chicken tender. I'd say they look pretty good. They kind of passed the visual test. Yeah, when I tore this apart, I was worried that the texture wasn't gonna be right. And unfortunately it's not. It's very spongy, it's very mushy. It just needs a little bit more texture. It's just like to make it resemble a chicken tender a little bit more. Obviously when you get an actual piece of chicken tender or chicken breast, you can kind of tear it and you see those strips and the fibers. They just really haven't got that hair. Flavor's not too bad though. We can also get chips from the bistro in the UK. It doesn't seem like you guys can do this in the US. We have our veggie dog option, which comes with the same toppings as the regular hot dog. So here we got fried onions. You can also get some with pickles. The veggie dog in the UK isn't like a plant-based meat thing. It is just vegetables. So it looks like there's some kale in there, some carrot, maybe like some mustard seeds. I think that with the fried onions, with the pickles and some sauce, actually a pretty good veggie option. Then we have some drink options, notably milkshakes. In the UK, you can get milkshakes in four flavors, vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, and banana. So we've got a banana one today, or a little sip. That's not bad, pretty gentle banana flavor. It's mostly just ice cream, but with like a little bit of flavoring in there, which who, can, who could say no? Ikea in the UK does serve breakfast, although unfortunately when we arrived today, they weren't serving it. The options that you'll find there are pretty much everything that you would normally find on a full English breakfast. So it includes things like bacon, sausages, hash browns, beans, tomatoes, mushrooms, black pudding. Sometimes you'll find things like patty scones as well. And you can also get white or wholemeal toast. If breakfast platters aren't your thing, then you can also just go for some fruit or some porridge. Breakfast. The breakfast platter in the US also comes in both regular and small sizes. And it's made up of eggs, potatoes, bacon, Swedish pancakes, and now it's supposed to be topped with the lingonberry jam and then give it to us. The US breakfast menu also offers a Skagen croissant sandwich, which is a croissant filled with traditional Swedish shrimp salad. It didn't happen. I think IKEA has its own line of drinks available in its restaurants. The US IKEA's you'll find cola, sugar-free cola, sparkling raspberry juice, lingonberry juice, and sparkling lemonade. I went ahead and got the lingonberry juice. Straight up no idea what a lingonberry is, but it's fantastic. 
there's no difference in the size cups. You just have glasses that are the same size or these to-go cups or whatever. We have some drink options at the restaurant in the UK that you guys might not have in the US. There are a couple of options for kids, which are these Pip Organic Juices. We have a couple of Robinsons options in the UK. Robinsons is probably the most popular brand of squash in the UK, and this is basically just a diluted version of their squash. Squash, for those who don't know, is like a concentrated fruity drink that you kind of water down to have a nice refreshing beverage. You can get a peach and mango version or a raspberry and apple version. And if you feel like celebrating any of your purchases that you've just made from the IKEA, you can also get alcohol. We have three alcoholic options on the menu at a UK IKEA, a rosé wine, a red wine, or a dark lager. Finally, IKEA has a Swedish market where you can buy pre-packaged food items to take home. The items on offer include some of their classic foods like the meatballs, which you can buy frozen, or some gravy sachets, which you can make at home. In the UK, you can also find the plant-based balls on offer in there. You can get a whole frozen dime cake, which I will be taking home and eating all by myself. And speaking of dime, you can also get the chocolate, which the cake is based on. Here, it's in bite-sized form rather than as actual chocolate bars, but as you can see, it's chocolate with a kind of hard caramel center. Charlie has dips on these. Another thing at the US, Ikea, maybe not exclusives per se, but of course they have a whole thing of frozen stuff. How to scrap stuff that was interesting. Come on, the cinnamon, the cinnabuns, huh? The cinnamon buns, meatballs. And, you know, we were talking about the dime cake, but um, they do have it frozen to take home. And of course it is the dime cake. Let's compare the nutritional information of some iconic IKEA dishes in the US and the UK. In the UK, eight IKEA meatballs contains the following. 342 calories, 25.1 grams of fat, 8.2 grams of carbs, and 856 milligrams of sodium. In the US, the same plate of Swedish meatballs contain 304 calories, 22.4 grams of fat, 6.4 grams of carbs, 592 milligrams of sodium. The UK takes this round in every category. What about the IKEA hot dog? In the US, it contains 260 calories, 15 grams of fat, 24 grams of carbs, and 780 milligrams of sodium. And in the UK, the hot dog contains 293 calories, 15.2 grams of fat, 29.5 grams of carbs, and 708 milligrams of sodium. Looks like the UK version is higher in calories and fat once again. USA, baby! What's actually in the iconic IKEA meatballs? According to the IKEA website, if you want to make their meatballs at home, you use the following ingredients. Beef mince, pork mince, onion, garlic, breadcrumbs, milk, egg, and salt and pepper to taste. But is that actually the ingredients list for proper IKEA meatballs? Well, on the back of the frozen packet, you'll find an ingredients list. According to this packet, they contain beef, pork, water, breadcrumbs, egg, dried onion, salt, egg powder, black pepper extract, and allspice. Overall, it seems like it's pretty close to the list that they gave you on the website, with a few more things like powdered ingredients versus fresh ingredients, and a couple of spice differences too. I wasn't able to find it online or in the cafeteria, the ingredients list, but I got here the frozen pre-cooked meatballs and those ingredients, hmm, actually not bad. Assuming these are the ones that they have in the cafeteria in the US, uh, the ingredients for this is beef, pork, water, breadcrumbs are made of unbleached wheat flour, salt, and yeast, whole eggs, salt, dehydrated onion, a white, that's not plural, a white, singular, spices. That's not bad, I think, for a prepackaged product, right? It's like, well, that's, you know, it's what's in them, right? While we're on the subject of IKEA ingredients, one thing that UK viewers might remember was our infamous horse meat scandal. Back in 2013, a number of foods in the UK claiming to be beef or pork were actually found to contain traces of horse meat. While this wasn't necessarily a health issue, it did raise some major questions concerning the traceability of foods throughout supply chains. And unfortunately, IKEA was also caught up in this scandal. Czech authorities found traces of horse meat in some IKEA meatballs that had been produced in Sweden and shipped all around Europe. Thankfully, the horse meat meatballs were found before they reached consumers. In total, 760 kilograms of meatballs were destroyed. Given the fact that there's no health concerns related to the consumption of horse meat, I think they should have just leaned into it. Just pass them off as like limited edition horse meatballs and just go with it, lads. It's fine. IKEA's food is almost suspiciously cheap. And it's actually one of the ways it tricks you into spending more time and money in its stores. 
IKEA is basically willing to take its losses with its cheap food prices because it's counting on you to spend a bunch of money on furniture and other household items. A former IKEA executive even referred to the meatballs as the best sofa seller. In the UK, a plate of eight meatballs, peas, mash or chips, gravy, and lingerie jam will set you back just £4.95. At the time of recording, that's around $6.49. I do have to say that's really cheap. I don't think the quality is that bad. It's really tasty food. And yeah, it's a real bargain. I will make an effort to go via the restaurant if I'm just going through Ikea. Even if I'm just popping in for like one or two bits, I'm gonna sit down, eat a plate of meatballs. It's good value. It's tasty. I love it. An eight meatball meal in the US is $9.99, which in the UK is £7.80. That's a 50 4% increase in the States. Overall, I would say IKEA is pretty popular in the UK. It's most people's go-to for basic furniture and household needs, I would say, especially when people are buying a house or moving house or something like that. Personally, I love IKEA. I love going there. I do enjoy a trip. It's fun. I like the food. I like walking around and pretending like, ooh, that could be my apartment or my bedroom or my kitchen. I wouldn't say IKEA is somewhere I go often, particularly because I live in quite central London and there aren't many in central London. I think they're trying to open one on Oxford Street right now. At the time of recording this, it wasn't open, but they're kind of trying to get there. But so, like I say, it's more of a place where you'll go specifically when you need to do an IKEA shop. IKEA is so popular here. I think it's popular in the whole country. Um, the one in Burbank, we went there at 10.30 in the morning. It opens at 10 and at 10.30, the parking lot was pretty full. The cafeteria line was full. So I'd say Ikea is pretty popular. I personally wouldn't go to Ikea just for the food. Again, it might be because I don't live close enough to one to make that worthwhile. I do love the food. The meatballs are great. Like I say, the desserts are fantastic, but I don't like it to the extent that I would make the effort to travel to one just to eat there. I'm not gonna say I go to Ikea for the food, but the food definitely is a good motivator to go to Ikea. I will say overall, I do enjoy the experience of going to an Ikea. I am aware that it's kind of designed to make us spend money. Obviously the restaurant plays a part of this as well, because it's kind of encouraging you to make a day of your trip to Ikea, really spend some time there, sit down, take a break in the middle of the day, eat, re-energize yourself for more shopping. And as you can guess by my friends on the table with me here, I do think that their marketing is a really clever ploy to make us spend more money there as well. I'm joined here by my friend Dungal Skog. I'm really sorry, I'm gonna butcher these pronunciations. And uh, my friend Blahai, who is the adorable little shark, who is also, I think, a trans icon. Love that. You'll often see things like this really getting like a reputation on the internet, driving more commerce to IKEA stores. I don't know if they're doing that deliberately or if it's just kind of like a side effect of making some very, very cute plush toys. But everyone I think will generally have at least one thing from IKEA in their home. So whatever they're doing, it's kind of working. I'm not mad about it either. I support IKEA. Keep up the good work, guys. I've just been informed by my fellow producer, Yuli, that they went on dates at IKEA. Explain, I'm gonna, what? Honestly, it's Yeah. I didn't think, that's a good way to get to notice someone's first you start eating, the food's dirt cheap, so, great? Okay, great. And then you walk around and they'd be like, this is the kind of couch I like, this kind of art I like, and you're like, no, nah, they're into that, huh? If this goes where we're thinking about it's going, this is the kind of bedroom set up they want, mm, I don't know. And also if the person starts like dogging, like you see something that you like and they start dogging on it, you're gonna be like, ah, this ain't gonna work out. From calorie count to portion sizes, we wanted to find out all the differences between Pop-Tarts in the US and the UK. This is Food Wars. In the UK, Pop-Tarts come in one main size, an eight pack. You might also be able to find a 36 pack online, but these seem more geared towards retailers rather than consumers. So for the purposes of Food Wars, we're not counting them. In the US, our Pop-Tarts come in seven size varieties. Down here with the two pack, eight pack, 12 pack, 16 pack, the value pack, 32 pack, the family pack, I don't know if you can see it says family on there, and the biggest amount, the 48 pack, they probably also come in one box. That means our biggest Pop-Tart variety is 33.3% bigger than what you can get in the UK. But other Pop-Tarts the same size in both countries? Let's measure them to find out. So our UK Pop-Tart was eight centimeters wide and 11 centimeters long for a surface area of 88 centimeters squared. We will do the same. Three by four. And of course, we're gonna weigh it. And a Pop-Tart in the US weighs 48 grams. Our UK Pop-Tart was bang on 50 grams, which I think is actually slightly more than it's supposed to weigh. Kellogg's uh, woke up feeling a little generous today. But what about the pastry to filling ratio, I hear you cry. Well, don't worry, we're gonna look at that too. You can sort of like chisel off layers of pastry. 
I mean, there's really not much jam in there. That's a very thin layer of jam right there. I think we might have to abandon this. It's gone real bad. So unfortunately we had to abandon the scrape test because that was not working. Joe, if you pulled that off, you're a genius. I don't know how you've done it. However, on the back of the box of the Pop-Tarts, it says that the fruit filling should be 34% of the Pop-Tart by weight. If our maths are correct, this was a 50 gram Pop-Tart. 34% of that should be 17 grams of jam. Yeah, anyway, all right. Hot, hot, hot. Hot, ow, mmm. Ow, mmm. -hmm. Let me get away from it on here, right? We'll round up to 10 grams. <laughs> so that is this percentage of jam. Here's all the Pop-Tarts you can get in the US, you can't get in the UK. And here are all the Pop-Tarts from the UK that you can't find in the US. Yes, it's just the one. <laughs> we got all of them. Want to get this out of the way real quick. There are currently two limited edition Pop-Tarts out right now, the red, white, and blueberry, and the frosted strawberry throwback. I went to Walmart, guy said they didn't have them. Also, newer ones, there is an Apple Jacks frosted apple cinnamon one, which is supposed to be delivered to my house tomorrow. I'm sorry. But one new one we do have is frosted banana bread, which is, looks like a Pop-Tart. Gave us some extra frosting up top there. Yeah, it tastes like banana bread. That's just very good. You can only find three Pop-Tart varieties on sale in the UK, including Strawberry Sensation, Frosted Chocotastic, and Hot Fudge Sunday. These two you can also find in the US, so they're not exclusives, but this one is, the Frosted Chocotastic. While it has its own name, it does seem a little bit similar to the US Chocolate Fudge one, so we'll take it out and have a look. So this is a UK Frosted Chocotastic Pop-Tart. It's got the chocolate icing, the pastry itself is chocolate flavored, and then it's got these little flecks of white stuff on it. Ambitiously in my mind, I was hoping it might be like flaky sea salt, but it's a Pop-Tart. I think it's more likely to just be some icing. Not too bad. You also have a chocolatey filling on that as well. So there's kind of like three levels of chocolate going on here. Not too sweet either, actually. All right, starting with the frosted chocolate fudge. Now let's compare this to what Harry got. Chocolate on chocolate. I know I was just gonna say the obvious, but this is like really chocolatey and fudgy. Seeing as we only have three Pop-Tarts, I figured I'd try the other ones too, just to see how they stack up against the exclusive Chocotastic. So this is our version of Hot Fudge Sunday. Pastry-wise, looks kind of similar to the chocolate one with the chocolate pastry, but then it has something more resembling the strawberry icing. I feel like this is probably a slightly lazy attempt to just kind of rehash things they already have into a new product. The filling looks pretty similar to the filling found on the frosted chocotastic. Slightly lighter in color, so maybe they've gone for more of a fudge vibe rather than just straight chocolate. I think with a combination of the standard icing and the slightly different filling, this has more of a well-rounded, balanced sweet flavor to it. And of course, the classic strawberry Pop-Tart. Obviously, visually this stands out because they have not gone for the chocolate pastry. It's that very kind of almost alarmingly pale pastry color. Pretty much the same icing I think that they've used on the chocolate fudge sundae. It's the classic for a reason. It's just really good. It's a blueberry, all right, getting some fruit. I wouldn't be able to guess what fruit this was, just but on the outside of me. Here in the US so far, one thing I've noticed, they're really skimping on the filling. I know it's like dusty, but brown sugar cinnamon, beat up, ooh, this is like really smooth. Also very dusty. I honestly can't tell if the flavor is the frosting or the jam. Cherry, I mean, I feel this is like a flagship one. Aim's not so great over there in the factory. Already though, both on this side and this side, you can almost see the filling coming out of it, right? I'm starting to think a lot of the sweet fruit flavor is coming from the frosting and not the inside. Chocolate chip. All right, already this. Can we get that sad trombone, please? It's like so, it's like a doctor's signature. It's just whoop, right across it. I can't read this. What does this say? Oh, oh. Pop tart. Ooh, this really irritates me. This really winds me up. Oh, you gotta be kidding me with this. Your mom or your school or your work, whenever doesn't get Oreos, they get the knockoff brand sandwich cookies. And it's like, you'll eat them, but you're like, oh man, I kind of wanted Oreos. That's what this tastes like. It tastes like a knockoff of an Oreo. Frosted confetti. Ugh. Oh, don't make me eat this. Please don't make me eat this. It's like just eating straight frosting. Next up, frosted hot fudge sundae. Breakfast is served. This looks like an absolute nightmare. Imagine eating this and going to school. Totally phoned in like that drizzle. 
It's very sweet. Oh man. A Pop-Tart S'mores, Yuli's Choice. Okay, it tastes like a s'mores. You can see a little pocket of marshmallow there. This is the first dual filling I think I've had, or at least I've noticed, and you know what? I don't really like it. I can't believe we only had one exclusive. I feel like I'm really missing out on some of those tasty American Pop-Tarts. Joe, can I get some of those? No worries, man, I gotcha. Ah! Thank you. So it looks like Joe has kindly shared with me some confetti cupcake Pop-Tarts, the American version of the Hot Fudge Sunday Pop-Tarts, and some frosted s'mores Pop-Tarts. Frosted confetti. I feel like Americans are just obsessed with eating sprinkles because it seems like every kind of brand, whether it's chocolate, pastry, will have a kind of confetti cupcake birthday cake flavor. And Pop-Tarts are no exception. American sprinkles look so much better than British sprinkles. I know it's because they are using banned chemicals, which we don't have over here. We have to opt for natural alternatives. But when it comes to baking, they just hold their color so much better. They look a lot more vibrant. I kind of get why you guys are using it. It doesn't give me any pleasure to admit it, but that is really tasty. It's got almost like a sort of cake batter taste to it, that filling. So it kind of is like you're eating a confetti cupcake, or at least the batter of a confetti cupcake. In my left hand, I have a British strawberry sensation popped up. In my right hand, I have the American frosted confetti cupcake one. Just quickly wanted to point out the color difference because that is wild. Next up is the American version of the Hot Fudge Sunday Pop-Tarts. The American version of these looks so much more fun than ours. Size-wise, they look pretty much the same, but the American one looks thicker. The American one has this white icing filling, whereas in the UK, I think they've gone for more of a kind of like fudgy chocolate filling. The difference between these two is kind of night and day. The American one, better than ours in pretty much every way. I tasted this at first and I wasn't disappointed by it per se, but now that I've had the comparison, a direct comparison with the US, this tastes like eating cardboard. Finally, it's the frosted s'mores popped up. I gotta say, s'mores aren't really a thing in the UK. In the UK, we don't have graham crackers, or as we would pronounce it, graham crackers. Shout out to my dad, Graham. Yeah, there we go. There we go. It's almost like a digestive biscuit. These are pretty good. This one looks maybe the scariest. It's cookies and cream. Whenever it's frosting inside, I know I'm in trouble. Yuck. Don't give this to a child ever, and most adults should also not eat this. Grape, grape, fruit ones. Look how I think a pop tart's supposed to look. They don't look that intimidating. Grape is a really popular flavor in the U.S., but anyone in the U.S. will tell you that grape-flavored candy doesn't really taste like grapes. They somehow invented a grape-like flavor, probably because grapes have like a weaker flavor, I think. I'm not quite sure exactly how it came to be, but this tastes exactly like that fake imitation bubblicious bubblegum grape, you know what I'm talking about, a grape soda. It's not bad. So far, the, all the fruit ones are better than any of the other ones, so. Yeah, Eggo. How unnatural looking is this? You know you can take those classes, I think they're called like sip and paint, where everyone paints the same picture, the same still life while they're sipping wine with their friends. This was the image they were painting, and this is what they painted drunk. This does not in any way taste like an Eggo waffle. I don't think it tastes like waffles at all. What ruins it is this frosting on here. This is so sweet. Raspberry. I have a feeling this is gonna be a good one. Yeah. Top tier right here. These were optimized for fruit filling. Wild berry. So it's just the combinations wild, or these were found in the wild? Oh no. Alarm bells in my caveman DNA is going off. Do not eat, this is poisonous. Do not eat. Warning, warning. Your ancestors who ate this died. Let's go against millions of years of evolution and bite into this woefully bright colored piece of, I'm assuming, food? We'll find out together. With all the frostings on here, it's actually not that sweet compared to the other fruit ones. Play this part of the video to uh, the ambulance driver when he asks what happened. Boston cream, Boston cream donut is this donut right here if you haven't seen it. You can't even tell where the cream is in the, compared to the color of the, the pastry. What I'm about to say will come as no surprise to anyone watching this video, but this one tastes completely artificial. I know, right? Can you believe it? On to the next smaller pyramid. Snickerdoodle. Bland. All right, look at the unfrosted ones. Unfrosted? 
unfrosted, we got strawberry, brown sugar, cinnamon, and blueberry. Unfrosted, the frosted. I was complaining how sweet they were, so maybe I'm more of an unfrosted guy and I don't realize that, but this looks weird. This looks like an army ration. This one is sweeter, but not that much sweeter. Don't you think with the frosting it'd be night and day? They're pretty similar. Simply frosted harvest strawberry. There you go, no artificial colors. Color from natural sources. Once again, regular strawberry uh, Pop-Tarts. They look pretty similar, right? This one even has more frosting on it. Wow, they taste exactly the same as the artificial ones. One other thing that we wanted to talk about was the toasted versus untoasted Pop-Tarts debate. Now, people have been debating for years whether it's better to eat your Pop-Tarts toasted or straight out of the packet. I will say in the UK, this is less of a debate because I feel like most people are more likely to toast their Pop-Tarts, even though they are safe to eat straight out of the packet. However, we did notice that on the American ones that Joe sent over, there are some varying instructions which kind of confused us. Apparently in the US, you can microwave them, which you're supposed to do in bursts of three seconds until they're hot enough to eat, despite the fact that the British ones explicitly tell you to not microwave them. I'm assuming at some point someone tried to microwave them in the foil and was met with a nasty surprise. And also the American ones say that you can freeze them and eat them frozen. Don't know why you would do that. Frozen or semi-frozen pastry does not sound like it would be nice. But we're not here for microwaved or frozen Pop-Tarts. We're just gonna heat a couple up in the toaster oven and then compare them to some untoasted Pop-Tarts to see which ones I prefer. All right, toasty boy, going in. Let's see if we can uh, rectify that. Also, did you, did you notice? What is with Harry's giant toaster oven? And the size of that thing, let's get a regular toaster. Ta-da! Smells like toasted pastry. Oh. Hey! Ooh, it is falling apart, so it's breaking apart already. Uh, untoasted. Yeah, toast is way better. The filling's more flavorful. The crispiness of the pastry. I just am too lazy to toast them. So this one on my right is the untoasted version, and on my left is the toasted version. I gotta say, visually, not a lot has changed. I was hoping for a little bit more browning while it was in the oven. Still not much of a snap from the pastry, even when toasted, but you can see that the filling has slightly liquefied. It's really impressive that they've actually managed to create a pastry that doesn't just burst and leak all of the filling when it does get toasted. I say impressive, probably just uses a lot of chemicals. Whereas when you compare it to the untoasted one, even when you kind of squish it down, that filling is not going anywhere. I do prefer the toasted version, as I sort of expected. I think the main difference for me is actually in the filling. Obviously the flavor doesn't change a lot when you toast it. It's more the texture, I think. Just the fact that it does liquefy slightly gives it a much more pleasant texture when you actually bite into this thing. Also in the US, you get something called Pop-Tarts Bites. These guys right here. I have strawberry, of course, and uh, confetti cake. But you can also get ground sugar cinnamon, frosted blueberry, frosted chocolate fudge, and strawberry banana. I have no idea what these are. No, these are not good. Pop-Tarts also does collabs with other brands. For instance, there's a uh, Pop-Tarts Jenny's ice cream. Coffee Mate has its own Pop-Tarts flavor. And of course, Pop-Tarts cereal. It was originally called Pop-Tarts Crunch, discontinued, but they renamed it after they brought it back. In the UK, an eight pack of strawberry Pop-Tarts costs you two pounds 99 pence, which is around $3.86. That same box in the US is $4.49 or three pounds 47 a 16.3% increase in the US. Oof, with the gouging, come on guys. It's not surprising me that Pop-Tarts are really popular in the US. We love a quick and convenient breakfast. They have positioned themselves in their advertising as a more convenient breakfast than cereal. Cause you know how inconvenient cereal is. You gotta get the box and the bowl and the spoon and the milk and sit down and eat it. Not Pop-Tarts, cereal, too much work. Pop-Tarts, way easier. For me, the price increase per portion makes sense because I've always seen Pop-Tarts as more of a treat than an everyday breakfast food. It was the sort of thing that my mum might have let me had as like a weekend treat breakfast if I had accompanied on her weekly shop and been very well behaved. I will say that the marketing in the UK explicitly doesn't brand these as a breakfast food compared to something like cereal. There is no mention of the word breakfast anywhere on here. They're just referred to as toaster pastries. So I guess they could be construed as more of a snack. Is the lack of breakfast talk the same in the US, Joe, or are you guys a bit less shameless about marketing desserts as breakfast foods for children? 
So I originally thought this was supposed to be breakfast food, but Harry makes a good point. It doesn't say breakfast anywhere on here. Even the box says you can get them straight from the foil, toasted, stacked, or frozen, but they really are not saying anything about breakfast. So I went back and looked online. In the 90s, I looked on YouTube, I found a bunch of commercials where they said, specifically for breakfast, they even quote, part of your complete breakfast. So they did sometimes market them as breakfast foods and then sometimes not. And just for me, it sunk in that, yeah, you have these for breakfast in the morning when you're in a hurry to get to school or work. Here is the nutritional information for one strawberry pop tart in the UK. Let's be honest, they come in packs of two, so we're gonna double those numbers for a more accurate serving size reading. Thank you, Harry. Because in the US, we go straight for the two tart serving size. And here, our strawberry Pop-Tarts are... It looks like the UK numbers are actually slightly higher than those in the US, so I guess that means we're winning? Now, if calories are your thing, in the US, our cinnamon brown sugar Pop-Tarts have the most, 400 per serving. How about weight? The unfrosted, have even more calories, 410 per serving. I don't know how that works either. In 2021, somebody sued Kellogg's claiming that Pop-Tarts contained way less strawberry than what was presented on the packaging. This case was ultimately dismissed as the judge said, quote, no reasonable consumer could believe from Kellogg's packaging that the breakfast staple, hey, breakfast, perfect, okay, contains only strawberries or more strawberries than other ingredients such as pears and apples. The U.S. packaging actually states that the strawberry Pop-Tarts contain 2% or less of dry strawberries. Here are all the ingredients of a U.K. strawberry sensation frosted Pop-Tart. One thing to note is that the gelatin used in a U.K. Pop-Tart is explicitly labeled as beef gelatin. So unfortunately, this means that British Pop-Tarts are not suitable for vegetarians. And here are all the ingredients in a U.S. strawberry Pop-Tart. Do-do-do-do. Of the many differences between these two lists, there are a few ingredients we wanted to highlight here. The first is TBHQ, or tert butyl hydroquinone. <laughs> to be honest, quite. <laughs> this is a preservative which is used to extend shelf life, or for added freshness, as the US label states. The FDA has put limits on how much it can be used. TBHQ can account for more than 0.02% of the oils in a food because the FDA doesn't have evidence that greater amounts are safe. While that doesn't mean that more than 0.02% is dangerous, it does indicate that higher safety levels haven't been determined. Research has linked TBHQ to health problems. The National Library of Medicine found vision disturbances when it was consumed by humans, as well as liver enlargement, neurotoxic effects, convulsions, and paralysis in laboratory animals. Pop-Tarts in the US also contain synthetic food coloring, which are restricted in the UK. Specifically, yellow five, yellow six, red 40. Because of their link to hyperactivity and inattention in children. Golly gee, I can't imagine why. The brain is going all over the place. Another thing to note is that the Pop-Tarts Joe sent me are technically contraband items. If you're working with the police or the government and you watch this, please do not extradite Joe, we need him for filming. That's because the flour used in US Pop-Tarts is bleached. Bleaching flour has been banned in the UK since the 1990s over concerns about potential health effects. It also just seems unnecessary to me, especially for something that's going to be toasted and darkening colour anyway. You guys just love putting chemicals in your food and seem to seize any opportunity you can to do it. Yeah, don't arrest me, but he did ask me to send it, so I will flip on the UK team in a second. FBI, if you're watching, I will wear a wire. It was all Harry's idea. I will help you take him down. From calorie count to portion sizes, we wanted to find out all the differences between Hard Rock Cafe in the US and the UK. This is Food Wars. Let's break down the burger that started it all, the original legendary burger. Let's weigh the US burger. 318 grams. Here's the original legendary burger in the UK. Let's weigh it. Our burger weighed 280 grams. That's a pretty big difference from 280 to 318 grams. This is a heavy, heavy burger. And of course, all their burgers come with a side of seasoned fries. We're gonna weigh ours to see how much we're getting. So our side of fries came to 178 grams. They feel so soggy right now in my hands. So that is 126 grams of french fries. Another iconic menu item is baby back ribs. We're gonna weigh our UK portion to find out how much we're getting. Is that too heavy? <laughs> 335 plus, oh God, <laughs> 300, 635 grams. This is heavy. This is 802 grams of ribs. That sounds like too much ribs for one sit-down dinner. That's a lot of ribs. 
The cowboy ribeye is supposedly 16 ounces of beef. Let's see if that's actually true. This is 12.8 ounces of meat. Meat does shrink, so a little wiggle room is to be expected, but I feel like that's supposed to be a pretty decent chunk. We booed. Everyone's booing. <laughs> Everyone's booing me. So after being booed by everyone, I'll be more upset about losing out on some of this meat. It just looks like such a big portion that I'm like, it's fine. But it is four ounces that we're missing that was advertised. So I understand. I understand why everyone's upset. Strangely, the cowboy ribeye is advertised as being 14 ounces here in the UK. I'm not sure why we're getting shortchanged, but we're going to measure it to keep them honest. So our UK cowboy ribeye has actually only come to 10 and a half ounces. I understand that steaks do lose some of their mass while cooking, but three and a half ounces? That seems like a lot. Let's get into some apps. We got the classic nachos, no meat. This is Food Wars, so you know we gotta weigh these nachos. 602 grams. Here are the UK nachos. I'm gonna weigh them with the paper because our scale has had enough trauma already. Our UK nachos weighed 510 grams. I'm interested to see which country has bigger wing portions, so let's count them out. Count them out with me. We have one, two, three, four, 10, 11, and 12. Seven, eight. I'm gonna let them have this one. I'm gonna let them have this one because we've literally been destroying them in these portion sizes this entire time. So you know what? You deserve the extra amount of wings. Hard Rock Cafe is also known for its famous onion ring tower. Now on the menu, they don't specify how many onion rings you get in a tower. However, in a promotional photo, I counted eight. So we're gonna count ours out now and see if that's true or if we get more or less than we were promised. I'm gonna try my hardest to beat Harry in the onion ring tower making. Somehow built this uh, the wrong way around, <laughs> so it's getting wider at the other top. Six, seven, <laughs> I'm not doing that again. <laughs> Eight, nine, ten. Girls in STEM. So while my tower design failed horribly, we did get 11 onion rings in our onion ring tower as a side. What about dessert? Let's compare Hard Rock's apple cobbler in the US and the UK. It smells so good. I'm resisting every urge I have to bite into it right now. We've got 432 grams of apple cobbler. So the apple cobbler in the UK came to 376 grams. Here are all the menu items you'll find at a Hard Rock in the UK that you won't find in the US. Here's all the food that you'll find at Hard Rock Cafe in the US that you won't find in the UK. There are a couple of burgers you'll find in the US, but not in the UK. The Turkey Burger and the Impossible Burger. I think Impossible Beef isn't available in the UK yet. There's an ingredient in it called soy like hemoglobin, which is approved in the US, but not in the UK. The Impossible Burger. That soy leg hemoglobin is doing what it needs to do. That's the ingredient that makes this taste like actual beef. Um, and it's working. It's working for me. I can tell texture wise in the back of my head, this is not beef, but it's like doing enough where I don't really care. It tastes pretty good. There's also a small difference in the classic legendary burger in the two countries. The UK uses just regular cheddar cheese, while the US specifically uses Tillamook cheddar. Tillamook is a popular creamery based in Oregon. I'm not gonna bite into everything here today because we are gonna give some of this away. But if there's anything that catches my eye particularly, then I'll give it a try. We actually have quite a few exclusives in the UK, so I'll start at this end and work my way down. First off, we have cauliflower tacos. I think they are pretty much as the name suggests. It's a taco, which is a, oh, I think is a flour tortilla with some pieces of seasoned cauliflower in there, as well as some slaw, some sauce, and some jalapenos. Next up, we've got barbecue chicken. This one really just does what it says on the tin. It's just half of a chicken, which has been grilled and covered in barbecue sauce. It's almost unnerving how accurately they have halved this chicken. <laughs> it's literally like they've just gone straight through the middle of it with like a laser beam and sliced the thing in two. The next exclusive menu item is fish and chips. You get this a lot. You might have a company which, branding-wise, seems like it's not from the UK, but when they launch in the UK, they feel compelled to have fish and chips on the menu. I will have to try this one. I can't let them off the hook if they've really butchered fish and chips. Although I will give them, again, some credit for the fact that this has been sitting around for a while and therefore has lost all of the crisp, which I think it once had. It's not too bad. I do think 
Had we eaten this hot and fresh, it would have been a bit crispier. You can definitely see some of the kind of like flakes of batter, which would have crisped up. Next up, we have the Moving Mountains Burger. Now we don't have the Impossible Burger on the UK menu because as of right now, Impossible Beef still cannot be sold in the UK. Moving Mountains is a company which does very similar things. It's making plant-based meat alternatives, including a beef burger which is approved for sale in the UK and is on offer here. I mean, visually, I gotta say, the Moving Mountains Burger does look pretty good. It's got like a nice brown exterior. They've got the kind of like grainy, like meat fibers almost in the middle. And it definitely like looks a bit pink even. I'm quite impressed by that. That's really not bad. Obviously it doesn't have the exact beef taste that you're used to, but there's definitely like a meatiness to it. Every Hard Rock Cafe location also has a local burger, which is inspired by ingredients found in that area. So this is the London burger. On here you will find a beef patty with some layers of roast beef, a horseradish mayo, rocket, some tomato, and some lettuce. Now the London burger is loosely inspired by a British Sunday roast, specifically the roast beef. I do think I need to taste this to uh, see if it's giving an accurate representation of British cuisine. They've been fairly generous with the roast beef slices, I have to say. Cheers. You definitely do get that like roast beef flavor from these pieces of beef. I think it could maybe have done with even more horseradish mayo because the flavor of that is really lovely. It's pretty good. Whether it's a accurate representation of London and London cuisine, I'm gonna go with no, but is it a tasty burger? Kind of, yes. New York City doesn't have a region specific burger, but they do offer a French dip on garlic bread. Joe made me aware that the French dip was not created in New York, but rather LA. But I can kind of see what they were going for because roast beef sandwiches in general are popular here. That includes French dips. And they might have chosen the garlic bread because New York City has so much Italian and Italian American culture ingrained in it. I feel like I'm kind of reaching right now, but I'm just trying to make sense of it all. This is the garlic bread that they speak of. Um, I think we need to have some words with Hard Rock Cafe. What is the sauce called? Oh, Bless you. Oh. Got her. Got both of them. <laughs> I'm taking a dip. I'm taking a dip. You can do it, you can do it. This is the coldest au jus and the coldest French dip. This is just not it. Go somewhere else. Go somewhere else. Hard Rock Cafe has also partnered with the greatest footballer of all time, Lionel Messi. Now I'm not sure if Messi's diet allows him to regularly eat at Hard Rock Cafe, However, he's partnered with them to release two burgers. You can find the Messi Beef Burger in both the US and the UK, but in the UK we have an exclusive one, the Messi Chicken Burger. Let's just take a look and see what we can find. So we have what looks to be maybe like a potato roll. We've got some bacon, some cheese, a big grilled chicken breast. There is some sauce on here as well. Mayonnaise, as well as tomato and lettuce. If I take a bite out of this, do you think I will gain the footballing ability of Lionel Messi? Whether that is a sandwich fitting for the goat, I'm not sure. Speaking of Messi, I think now's a great time to quiz Joe and see if he can pick him out in a group of photos. He is one of the most famous men in the entire world, so it shouldn't be hard, right Joe? So one of these persons is uh, Lionel Messi and uh, I don't know which one he is. Uh, well, this guy's from Ted Lasso, so I'm assuming it's not him, or someone would have said at some point, can you believe that guy is also a famous soccer player? Uh, this looks like a person who works in a cafe, so I'm assuming that's not, I don't know. Tough times for football players, apparently. I mean, this just looks like, I feel like I've seen this guy somewhere. I feel like this guy works at Insider. Who's this, this, is, this, is, this can't be him. This looks like a stock photo, and then this looks like, a guy from like a background extra in the Matrix. So, so I'm gonna think that it's this guy. Oh, it's not this guy. Yeah. This this guy is this yeah. super famous football soccer player. So I think I was right. This is Shutterstock, though. That kind of looks like the singer from Owl City. Like Harry's singer fan. Owl City. Hey, what do you want from me? None of this means anything to me. <laughs>
A legendary burger in the US contains 1,610 calories. Now, I don't know if they mean 1,610 calories with the fries or without, so just keep that in mind. According to the FDA, that is 81% of my daily recommended caloric intake. Here in the UK, the original legendary burger contains 1,375 calories which according to FDA guidelines is around 69% of my daily recommended allowance. A lot of food items on the Hard Rock menu are actually super high in calories, including the baby back ribs, which clock in at 2,433 calories. Here in the UK, the baby back ribs contain around 1,796 calories, which makes the US version around 35% more calorific. More detailed nutritional info for Hard Rock Cafe doesn't seem to be available online, but I did notice this little tiny salt symbol that was next to a whole bunch of dishes. This indicates that the sodium content of that item is higher than the total daily recommended limit, which is 2,300 milligrams. There's something about a fudge brownie with vanilla ice cream that feels very American food chain. In the US, this dessert contains 1,122 cals. I think it's worth it though. This thing looks really good. In the UK, the fudge brownie with ice cream comes to 2,009 calories. What we have here is the takeaway version, which I personally do not think contains 2,000 calories. I think what they're referring to is the in-restaurant version, which is an enormous chocolate fudge sundae with loads of ice cream, sauces, and more. In front of me now, I have a starter of 12 chicken wings with buffalo sauce. I have the main, which is the legendary burger and fries and I have dessert, which is an apple cobbler. Now, I would say this is a fairly standard dinner. I think it would be on the heavier side for a dinner, but if I was hungry, I could definitely polish off all three courses, no problem. However, if I ate all of this, I would be consuming 4,819 calories. I think those daily caloric intake values might be outdated and vary depending on the person. I'm not a nutritionist, I'm just a girl. In the US, an order of buffalo wings, a legendary burger, and a hot fudge brownie would cost around $52.97. Why in God's green earth is this burger $20? It looks good, just not $20 good. Hard Rock Cafe is a theme restaurant, and I feel like with a theme restaurant also comes pretty high prices. I think that's because they're kind of tourist trappy. They think people are willing to pay more because it's an experience and not just the food. In the UK, the same meal would cost you £43.85, which is $56.56. All of this food for £43 is kind of a lot of food, and as we've discussed, a lot of calories, but also, I don't think I'm getting that much value for my money. I feel like even in London, I can find better value elsewhere. And I do think it's kind of being marketed as kind of like a tourist trap or maybe kind of a special occasion treat meal. Did you know that the first Hard Rock Cafe was actually opened in London? It was the Hyde Park branch and it opened in 1971. It's pretty rare to come across a Hard Rock Cafe if you don't live in like a major city or tourist destination. I think because of that reason, they're not super popular here, even though they are popular in the sense that we know what it is. There are only 34 locations in the entire US and six of those are in Florida. 18% of the Hard Rock cafes in America are in Florida. But this is an international chain, so you can find Hard Rock cafes in over 50 countries, including Armenia, Nepal, Nigeria, and Poland. Hard Rock Cafe does have a very dedicated fan base. There's a community of collectors who will buy and swap commemorative merch from the different locations, including things like the pins, and of course, the iconic t-shirts and jumpers. Some superfans even celebrate Hard Rock milestones, like visiting your 25th location. I think I've got maybe 24 to go. Same, all we have to do is go to Florida and we can cross six more off our list. They sell normal American fare, which I can find anywhere, like at a Chili's or an Applebee's, chains that are much more available. The thing that makes Hard Rock Cafe special though, isn't the food, it's the memorabilia. The first piece of memorabilia donated to Hard Rock Cafe was Eric Clapton's Lee to Fender in 1979. Since then, they have amassed quite the collection with 86,000 pieces worldwide. Supposedly, it is the largest private collection of music memorabilia in the entire world. These days, the memorabilia is still either donated to them or sometimes purchased through auctions. There are some pretty cool pieces out there, including Elvis Presley's 24 karat gold leaf piano, handwritten lyrics for John Lennon's Imagine, and of course, One Direction's iconic phone box, which they used in their album cover shoot. I am so jealous that Harry got to take a picture with the One Direction phone booth. I don't care if something good happened to you, it should have happened to me instead. 
I did manage to get a picture with one of Beyonce's outfits from her green light music video. It's not as iconic as the One Direction phone booth, but it's something. We have a quote here from one of the Hard Rock Cafe founders, which we think is quite interesting. It says, the Hard Rock Cafe Mayfair's Grace was becoming London's first classless restaurant at a time when a baker and a banker could not commune, live, shop, or dine together. I think they might be reaching a little bit here. I do think that London in the 70s was kind of in its punk era. I think social barriers were already being torn down. We'd already had the kind of hippie movement in the 60s. I don't think Hard Rock Cafe can really claim that they were the only ones to break down social barriers. And there is nothing more punk than the Hard Rock Cafe. From calorie count to portion sizes, we wanted to find the differences between MREs and ration packs in the US and the UK. This is Food Wars. A US MRE is manufactured and packaged by Warnick, Ameriqual, and Sopaco, uh, and come in one standard pack size. UK MREs, or ration packs as we call them, are produced by Vesti Foods and come in three portion sizes. The standard portion is this, a 24-hour ration pack. You can also get a smaller version, which is a 12-hour ration pack. And our biggest portion is this. This is a 10-man operational pack, which contains 10 of these 24-hour ration packs. According to the Defense Logistics Agency website, a case of MREs, which is 12 meals, weighs around 22 pounds or 9.98 kilograms. So on average, one meal would be roughly 831.6 grams. The approximate weight of one of these ration packs is 1.75 kilograms, but we're gonna weigh it to see if that's accurate. So the weight of our 24 hour ration pack here in the UK was actually 1.49 kilograms. This is a bit lower than the promised 1.75. I don't know if you're a soldier in the field, if this is actually a positive thing because you've got less weight to carry, or if you're actually getting slightly less food than you were promised. In the UK, our ration pack menu number two contains a chili con carne. We're gonna compare ours to the American chili to see who's getting more. I do think I've lost a little bit in here. And if I were eating this straight out of the packet, maybe tearing the packet open, getting better access, I could probably get that closer to uh, the 300 mark. So here are the contents of a 24 hour ration pack in the UK. In total, we counted 29 edible items, as well as a few extra bits, including tissues, sanitary wipes, matches, and other stuff like that. We counted 11 edible items in our US ration pack. Here are all the military MREs for the US not available in the UK. And here are all the ration packs in the UK that you can't find in the US. There's actually very few overlap of specific meals in US MREs and the UK ration packs. Also, depending on which MRE meal you get, uh, they contain different combinations of snacks and sides. In both countries, official MREs are not available for sale directly to consumers. Basically, when you get a ration pack in the UK, it will come with a corresponding menu number. The menu number will give you a rough indication of what you're gonna find inside, although there is a bit of variation. So what we've done here is lay out the breakfast and the main course options in order of the menus. In the UK, we were currently able to get hold of menus one to 10. All right, we got the US MREs. I think we got every menu one through 24. We're gonna go through the entrees and the breakfasts now. I wanna point out that for the US MREs, not every single one came with a definitive breakfast. And some of them just had something that was fruit or fruit related, which we assumed was supposed to be eaten first thing in the morning. Now, all of these can be eaten either hot or cold. I guess ideally you'd have them heated up. We actually got sent this flameless heating bag. Instructions for use. This is either gonna go really well, or I'm gonna give myself and the Food Wars table some chemical burns. I'm gonna do a chili because we've already got a chili open and I kinda know what they taste like. Filter line only. And then leave that for 10 minutes. Oh. Well, it works. <laughs> I hope I've sealed that well enough because that steamed up very quickly there. So while that does its thing, I guess all that remains is for me to try the rest of them. Starting down here, remember our good friend, the chili? Not bad. I would say as average as chili can be. I think honestly, I've never been in the military. I haven't done any service, but I used to camp a lot when I was a kid. And I do remember going on like sometimes two, three week long canoe trips in Canada. Couple days in, this is like gourmet. You know what I'm talking about. Like your standards change quickly when you're outside all day. It comes with a cornbread. This cornbread muffin's actually like really good. Let's try it with the chili. So the breakfast that we got for menu one was pork, sausage, and beans in a tomato sauce. This is like kind of an iconic British meal, I can't lie. It's kind of good. <laughs> We're starting off strong. I like that. 
Next up, we have a Pindi Chana Alu, which seems to be like a potato and chickpea curry. And then the final option from menu one in the UK, meatballs and pasta. Do I have high or low expectations for meatballs and pasta? Yeah, I mean, I think my fear was that like pasta doesn't hold up very well when it's kind of submerged in a sauce and cooked for a while. And I think that's kind of come true. Meatballs are right though. Menu number two is shredded beef and barbecue sauce, but also came with seasoned black beans and tortillas. So, I mean, I don't know how you would do this out in the field with no plates and not a table. And then the beans, a uh, military taco. Here we go. These beans are rock solid. The consistency is a little weird. And this one is the chicken and noodles with vegetables and sauce. Yeah, this this looks like uh, like a can of like chunky soup or chunky stew before you heat it up. This definitely should be heated up before. And this, oh my God, this is brutal. If you had this and you couldn't heat it up for some reason, this is very bad. The first potential breakfast, the applesauce with raspberry puree. Now we're talking here. Oh my God, that does not taste like fruit. That tastes like pure sugar. There is fruit in it, but it tastes more like, like uh, fruit flavored soda. This will definitely wake you up in the morning. Then we're on to menu two, and the breakfast is a raspberry muesli with milk. Now it says with milk, but there is no liquid in here. So I think what they've done is actually put powdered milk in here and you add some water and then hopefully that kind of turns into something resembling milk. It looks very uh, chalky and powdery at the moment without the water in it. It says to add around 100 mils of water, mix it and then leave it to stand for a minute or so. But yeah, I mean, now that's looking a lot more like muesli. That's actually not bad. <laughs> I'm quite impressed by that. There is like a slightly noticeable difference between that and real milk. Then the mains for menu two, obviously the chili con carne, which we opened for the portion sizes section. Not the best visuals, but it's quite hard to make a nice looking chili anyway, so it's more about the taste. It's not spicy, pretty well seasoned. And then menu two also has a rajma masala. The longer I leave this one, I think this is the first one that has actually like a bit of heat to it, but not unpleasant at all, just like a nice, a nice warmth there. This hits close to home, spaghetti with beef and sauce. Oh, and it even came with Italian breadsticks. What do we think? It's not meatballs. They had meatballs. We only have meat sauce. Breadsticks. They're a bit dry. They're the most driest thing I've ever eaten. These are so dry. It's white chicken chunks. Oh no, it's just, oh God. Yeah, just canned white chicken. No, I'd, I'd be so bummed. Yeah, this is the worst one. So we got a beef taco filling with Santa Fe rice. Um, not horrible. Decent seasoning, but yeah. I think what's missing for all these is cheese. Then we're on to menu three and we have our first duplicate item. It's another muesli for breakfast. Now this one I'm intrigued by. One of the main options in menu three, steak and vegetables with dumplings. A classic British beef stew is kind of one of my favorite foods. <laughs> Having said that, I've opened this and it looks and smells like cat food. Now I've been eating most of these straight out of the bag because they've had a kind of texture which permits that, but this one I think we're gonna have to plate up. This uh, apparently is steak and vegetables with dumplings. Now I started this section by saying that all of these can be eaten hot or cold, and I do think that's true. I guess the question is whether or not all of them should be eaten hot or cold. And I think this one, just immediately from the look of it, I think probably needs to be heated up because we've had our uh, our first womp womp moment of the episode. God. That's not good. Beef strips in a savory tomato sauce. Marinara sauce with meatballs. Wait, so there's no noodles? Just sauce and meatballs? Oh my goodness, look how little these meatballs are. These little guys. There's no, there's no pasta in there, just the meatballs. Yeah, ooh, spaghetti level of meat flavor. Beef stew. No, at least this one has noodles. And this one came with a breakfast that was grape jelly. We're gonna jump ahead slightly to menu eight because that's where I've taken our hot main from. And the alarm has just gone off, which means it's ready to eat. Once it's cooked, just tear it along here. And then it's at the perfect height that you can then just also tear this and eat the whole thing. It's changed the consistency of this a little bit. I think with the steak and vegetables, for example, I think that would change the consistency a lot. Whereas this has just made it like a little bit more runny, but not too bad. It was very hot, but that's still really good. I think this one I do prefer heated up actually. It brings out a few more of the flavors, a little bit more depth of flavor to it. That's really good. And I'm so impressed with this like heating pad thing. The, uh, the heating pad, as well as just, I guess, warmed up meals. Thumbs up for me so far. Macaroni in a beef sauce. Well, that's good. 
We got noodles! And the chili. Oh, that's terrible. It doesn't taste like anything. Vegetarian taco pasta, which is a vegetable crumble with pasta and taco style sauce. Is this supposed to be zapple sauce? Who doesn't love a little apple sauce? Again, wow, super sweet. With sugar, not high fructose corn syrup, so that's a plus. And the last item from menu three is a beef burrito style filling with rice. Sadly, this does not come with any tortillas, so you can't make an actual burrito with it. There's a little bit more spice than anything else that I've had so far. The texture of the rice would be improved by heating this one up, because the rice is still like a little bit al dente. Albo macaroni and tomato sauce. Granted, I mean, I know I gotta heat them up. Yeah, this one's all right. Uh, mango, peach, applesauce. I'm liking the applesauce. This would be considered, I guess, a breakfast, or it's fruity, so maybe this you would have first thing in the day. Oh yeah, oh, this is really good. Next up, we got menu four, and we're starting with an all-day breakfast. Apparently, it differs from the sausage and beans because this contains some omelet as well as some bacon pieces. I think my only criticism of this is that the sauce that they put the beans in is like exceptionally sweet. Carrying on through menu four, we have a pasta bolognese main. I have a similar concern to the meatballs and pasta. I think that is like roughly the color that you want your bolognese sauce to look like. I think when I looked at this one, I was expecting worse. Again, like the vibe I'm getting, particularly from the pasta dishes, is very much like tinned pasta vibe, like a tinned bolognese. And the last menu four item is a chicken curry with potatoes and rice. There's actual like decent sized pieces of what I hope is chicken, less flavorful than some of the other ones. I want to try heating some of these up. You do this, then you put your MRE inside. Sorry, you can't tell red and water to this. Here we go. Real exciting stuff here in the studio. While we're moving on, so we got one, two, three heating up. The staff was able to make this thing work. I was not, I don't know why. But moving on, we have a cheese tortellini and a tomato sauce. Oh yeah, look at this, I got the whole, the whole tortellini right there. Then we're on to menu five, and we're starting off with another muesli. It's the third muesli we've had in five meals. The variation, I think, is gonna start to kind of run dry. Speaking of a lack of variation, meal five also has another pasta bolognese. The different option from meal five is a sweet and sour chicken with rice. Good color on it. Nice, uh, familiar orange color. There's pineapple in this, and water chestnuts. I'm kind of impressed. This is pretty good. I'd say this leans more on the balance of sweet rather than sweet and sour. I think with the water chestnut and also the kind of like pineapple chunks, there's still some things in there with bite, which I appreciate. Creamy spinach fettuccine with egg noodles, spinach, and mushroom in a cream sauce. Oh. It feels like they're going a little, I don't say overboard, because I figure you gotta have like a variety of meals, but doesn't like a fettuccine with mushrooms and a cream sauce like, after a long day of hauling stuff around and soldiering and this exhausting job and carrying all the stuff and just be like, ah, let's kick back with some spinach mushrooms and a cream sauce, like the, the most colorful one so far. I don't feel great. <laughs> I do not feel good. Next up is menu six, which we've actually covered all of already. Starts with an all day breakfast, which I've had, then moves on to a, another pasta bolognese, which I've also had, and finishes with my old friend, steak vegetables with dumplings, which I will absolutely not be trying again. This should be the Mexican style chicken stew. Oh, and then they're saying there's another tear here to remove the MRE. Very smart. So you got a second spot to tear. This is really smart. Second spot to tear. So it's easier just to grab the MRE out. All right, so the package is hot. So it feels like this is much, like kind of smoosh it around a little bit. So they are, Still flimsy tortillas, but looks like they're chipotle flavored. Not as gelatinous, I guess. Definitely better heated up. <laughs> yeah, I like this. This is pretty good. Next up is menu seven, which I don't know if this was deliberate or not, but appears to be like a fully vegetarian menu. For starters, we have a vegetarian all day breakfast. I think the main difference is that they've subbed out the meat sausages for vegetarian sausages. It's another one that seems to be like mostly beans. It seems very fitting that the British army is powered by baked beans. Makes you proud to be British. It's got the same issue as before that the beans are just like, I think too sweet. One of the main course options in menu seven is the Rajma Masala with rice, which I've again also had. But one that I have not had is a vegetable and chickpea biryani. I like a biryani. For those who don't know, it's just like various things, sometimes meat, in this case vegetables, cooked down with rice and a bunch of Indian spices. I've had much better biryani in the past. I'm sure there are lots of people watching at home and recoiling in horror at the thought of this being a biryani, but it's okay. And I think on the whole, the vegetarian menu, pretty good. Moving on, we have the chicken burrito bowl. 
which comes in a bag and not a bowl. Sure, a lot of this just like, I know, we got some heated up, so you can see the difference when it's not heated up. It's just this weird gel cube. And that comes with what essentially would be considered a breakfast, I guess, apple pieces and a spiced sauce. So the entree appears to be a maple flavored pork sausage patty. Okay, so just one block of yep. <laughs> ah, it is of course just this. It's like a uh, cliff bar, but pork. Not good, really weird. It tastes uh, surprisingly bland. A hash brown potato with bacon, pepper, and onions. Ooh, no! This is the most cat foodie looking. Thing. Menu eight is another duplicate one. We start with another all day breakfast. Then there's another chili con carne, which I've actually already heaten up and eaten. And we have another beef burrito style filling with rice. A cooked beef ravioli once again. It like heated the bottom of it. <laughs> so you still gotta kinda, still gotta massage it a little bit. Like this, this side is heated and then this middle part didn't get heated. It also came with tortillas, which is funny. This is what this looks like and it looks gross. Menu nine starts with more muesli. Then moves to a new dish, which is sausage casserole. This is another like classic British dish, a sausage casserole. Slow cooked, stewed sausages with tomato, potatoes, other vegetables. On the whole, the sausages have actually been like surprisingly good. It might just be because I quite like those slightly cheap, like pre-packaged sausages. And then for your other main course, we have another pindi chana aloo. This one, another hot one. Oh, it's just, so it's just gonna be a patty? Oh! It has a sauce, apparently. It's grilled jalapeno pepper jack, flavored. Comes with au gratin potatoes. Au gratin potatoes? What do you think of that? This looks really rough. Italian sausage with peppers, onions, and a marinara sauce. Yeah, okay. Menu number 21 should be lemon pepper tuna, or tuna chunks in a bag. We've just been informed that this bag actually says white chicken chunks, which we saw before. There is a lemon pepper tuna that we don't have. And finally, last but not least, we have menu 10, which starts with an instant porridge. The cooking instructions actually specify that you need to put boiling water in it, leave it for three minutes to soak, and then eat it. Whereas all the other ones are technically able to be eaten cold. Menu 10 has a couple of mains, one of which is another beef burrito style filling with rice. And our final main course is Hunter's Chicken. It's another, it's another plate one, uh, which I don't think is a compliment. Doesn't look great, does it? Um, this is Hunter's chicken. Traditionally, this is chicken breast with some bacon, some cheese, some barbecue sauce. I think bits of chicken in here, although I'm kind of struggling to see where. <laughs> I think it's these like small bits rather than like a chicken breast. No, that's really bad. <laughs> Beef goulash. Beef with brown rice, spinach, carrots, tomatoes, and smoked paprika. A pepperoni pizza and cheese slice. Mm. Army pizza. Oh God, that's so bad. This has been brutal. I don't know what it is about this food. Like, yeah, some things tasted bad, but most things just, just tasted okay. But I have a headache and my stomach doesn't feel good. I noticed there's a lot of sodium in these. So that might have something to do with it. Tortillas came with this one, the Southwest style beef and black beans with sauce. Again, there are very few breakfasts, but this one is Mixed fruit, which appears to be, there's some chunks in there, so you got a bag of mixed fruit. On top of the mains and breakfast options, you also get a dessert in a British ration pack. The options we got today included a chocolate brownie, a cinnamon cake, a vanilla cake, a chocolate cake, or an orange cake. The US MREs have an assortment of desserts, which looks all right. Muffin tops, cookies, puddings, cakes, a bun, a toaster, pastry cookies and cobblers. I'll try a couple of these. I wanna try the brownie because it's packaged differently to the others and because I like brownie. It looks a little bit more cakey than brownie-ish, but uh, we'll see. No, that's so dry. Starting down here, get a maple muffin top or a chocolate banana nut muffin top. Uh, three different types of cookies. You get a oatmeal chocolate chip cookie, Chocolate chip cookie and oatmeal cookie, that's funny. <laughs> and actually, now I think about it, we've got patriotic sugar cookies, could be in the cookie category. The packaging was different, so I separated them, but I'm curious what a patriotic sugar cookie looks like. Oh, no, nothing. These look like broken up Girl Scout cookies. Is that a rocket? What is that? I don't know what that is. Do you know what that is? Oh, like, oh my God, turn it around. Turn it upside down. Ah, it's the Liberty Torch. Oh, it's a bunch of different ones, but they're all broken up. Oh, oh well. 
These are pretty good. Then I wanted to try one of the cake options. It's actually probably the cinnamon that appeals to me the most, so. I mean, this looks better. It could be, again, slightly more moist, but it's got a pretty nice texture to it. There's definitely a cinnamon flavor there. In terms of like shelf stable baked goods, this is a much better effort than the brownie was. This is actually like perfectly edible. I have an assortment of pound cakes, applesauce pound cake, lemon poppy seed pound cake, vanilla pound cake, marble pound cake, uh, cinnamon bun, and a toaster pastry that just feels completely destroyed in here, so. I don't know what toaster you're using on the field, but all right. And last, this package that looks like all the other ones is a cherry blueberry cobbler. I think this is be fine. Oh, that's colorful. It just looks like a whole thing like jelly. Every ration pack in the UK also comes with four to five snack options. We've taken all of the ones we got from menus one to 10 and laid them out here. Snacks! Our US MREs come with a lot of snacks. Usually find three or four of these in each MRE in various combinations. So here we have a mixed fruit snack, which is like a fruit puree in one of these handy little pouches. First of all, I mean, how bright did these look just compared to all the packs we've been dealing with this whole video? Like I'm looking at these, I'm, I'm also gonna like turn the saturation oh. down. Peppermint candy rings, and then you got M&Ms, Twizzler nibs, more M&Ms, Skittles, Skittles, Reese's Pieces. Very nice, thank you. There are a few different peanut options on the menus in the UK starting with barbecue peanuts, some chili peanuts, and the classic salted peanuts. Dried fruit, dried cranberries, raisins, and a trail mix that has uh, a nut raisin mix for the trail. Here we have cheddar cheese flavor spread. In the UK, if you're having cheese, you have like cheese and crackers. So I feel like maybe this is supposed to be enjoyed with some of these crackers down this end. Down here, three different types of energy bars you can get. I've never heard of the brand First Strike. Not sure if that is a brand that exists outside the military, but you can get an apple cinnamon, chocolate, or cran raspberry energy bar. Oh, geez, look at this thing. Not a bunch of junk. <laughs> it tastes okay. Next, we have a fruit flapjack. Flapjack in the UK is a mixture of oats, syrup, butter, and often raisins, which are kind of like packed together to make a nice nutritious sweet treat. This is an oatmeal block. I'm not really sure what this is. I'm actually gonna open this one just out of curiosity more than anything. Looks like a sort of shortbread biscuit on the outside. Yeah, somewhere between like a digestive biscuit and like a rusk, which for the uninitiated, is like, I think, an oaty biscuit that's basically made for babies. I feel like I used to steal rusks from my baby sister when she was little. Sorry, Annie. Trail mix granola nuts, you got it. Um, packages of either dry roasted nuts. Man, they really suck this thing dry, look at that. Same with this one, the uh, smoked almonds and jalapeno cashews. Recovery trail mix with pretzels, granola, and this trail mix that has Beef jerky in it. Want to mainline your jerky? U.S. government has you covered. Beef sticks. Here we have a sachet of peanut butter. We have three different types of jam that we found. We have apricot, we have plum, and we have strawberry jam. This is an exotic fruits nougat bar. Here we have a sesame bar, which is basically just sesame seeds held together with melted sugar. Apricot oat biscuits, a tropical fruit and nut mix, as well as just nuts and just fruit. Cheese-filled cracker, pepperoni flavor, uh, cheese-filled pretzel, cheddar flavor, pretzel nuggets, barbecue corn nuggets, barbecue flavored corn kernels, so like uh, corn nuts, right? Baked snack crackers, cheddar flavor, and uh, protein puffs, ring-shaped barbecue. I feel like if you get these ones, you've done quite well. These sound fancy. We have chocolate orange mini cookies and coconut biscuit bites. They sound like a more gourmet approach to uh, a ration pack snack. And to the breads and spreads, we'll call it. Multigrain bread. White wheat snack bread. Wheat snack bread. I mean, how good are the shots we have to get of these? Everything looks the same. And then this one, Italian bread, blah, blah, blah. Got it, okay, great. You have a vegetable cracker or a regular cracker. What do you want to put on those breads or crackers? You got chunky peanut butter, peanut butter, chocolate peanut spread, cheese spread. Cheese spread with jalapenos. Cheese spread with bacon. Here we have cheese and oat biscuits which I think are probably designed, like I say, to be eaten with the cheesy spread. Next up are biscuit browns. I wasn't sure what a biscuit brown was, and after tasting it, 
I'm still kind of equally unsure. It's like a sort of bran, like wheaty cracker type thing. For the fruit, you got apple jelly, strawberry jam, and I know there's a grape jelly from earlier. I don't know where it went, but it looks exactly like this package. And finally, we have a cookies and cream bar. That's not what I was expecting at all. When you hear cookies and cream, I'm right in thinking that you expect Oreo, right? Whereas this is more like a, like a Rice Krispie type of treat. Doesn't smell of Oreo at all. It literally smells of like, like a Rice Krispie treat, maybe dark chocolate. Doesn't taste great either. The US MREs have an assortment of different drinks, both, I guess, regular temperature and warm. So the first thing I wanna do before we get into that is point out that we have four different, in the middle here, coffee drinks, hot drinks you wanna, as you have it. This is a French vanilla cappuccino. Mm? And I wanna make it real quick. And we saw how we heated up the drinks before, so here also comes with a hot beverage bag. Pre-added the water, so now I'm gonna go ahead and put powder in here. Hey. This looks all right. Mix it up a little bit. Have me cappuccino. It smells like when the VCR gets really hot. You can watch like three movies in a row. Now we're onto the drink options, which again, I think you get four of in a 24 hour British ration pack. These all come in the form of powders, which you mix with water and then consume. They're also split into four different categories. We have just a standard drink powder. We have an energy drink powder, a fortified energy drink powder, and we have an isotonic drink powder. Having quickly scanned the ingredients of both of these, I'm actually not sure what the difference is between say an energy drink powder and a standard fruit flavor powder. There's no caffeine in the energy powders, for example. I think most of the energy is coming from the sugar content in these. While that's cooking, let's see what other drinks we have. We got orange, lemon, lime, and grape. That's definitely not grape colored. It says grape on here. I think it tastes like grape, but also because it's blue, I'm thinking blue raspberry. While my coffee is cooking, we also have different coffee flavors. I get a chocolate hazelnut protein drink, Irish cream cappuccino, chocolate protein drink. Regardless of the type of drink powder that you're getting, they do come in a bunch of different flavor options. I'm not sure if any of these particularly appeal to me. I'll try the tutti frutti one. I feel like of all of these, it sounds pretty fun. Yeah, I was really hoping that the color would be like a bright blue or pink or something. But it's just normal. It's unlocking some kind of like repressed alcohol memory, I think. I'm fairly sure I've drunk a, a cocktail to the point of oblivion that tasted pretty much like this. So this is my French vanilla coffee. Oh yeah, I'm not recognizing a lot of these words. But uh, yeah, this is nice. And the last thing we have here are beverage-based powders. Uh, so these had electrolytes in them. It's like energy drinks almost. And then these I think are just, uh, these have lots of sugar. So we have lemon lime, orange, and tropical punch. And then this little stick, beverage base orange type three. Finally, every ration pack in the UK also contains a bag of common items. We start down this end where we have some matches. Then we have some water purification tablets. I think there are six of these in here actually. And according to this, you can purify a liter of water per tablet. That's pretty good. I like that this is in the essential items thing. We have some hot sauce. We have some tissues, as well as two alcohol-free hand wipes. Then you have two tea bags, two sachets of instant coffee, four sachets of beverage whitener. I think, again, this might be something along the lines of they can't legally call this powdered milk, but it is effectively a powdered milk substitute. And four sachets of sugar. Our US MREs have these following accessories. First of all, over here, you've seen it a few times this episode the heating thing, the heating bags to heat up your food and your drinks. Saw this the whole time, the spoon. Every MRE comes with a spoon. Now, did you notice I had a difficult time kind of cutting into some stuff and I thought, why don't they have anything like a knife in here? Of course they have a knife, they're soldiers, they have pocket knives. Uh, they come with a um, concentrated beverage base. This one is cranberry grape. Over here is the coffee zone for the most part. Bill's brewed freeze dried coffee. You can do that to two hot or cold water. Six ounces right here. And you have your choice of either Splenda or sugar. Salt, uh, if you need more sodium on your food. This is a coffee creamer. Each pack of accessory comes with two pieces of gum. These are waterproof matches. Spice up that food a little bit, a little bit of Tabasco. Little Tabasco guy, look at this little guy. Right? 
a moist toilet, and regular napkins. In the US, MREs were first introduced in the 1980s and were designed to be lightweight, portable, and self-contained meals that didn't require cooking or refrigeration. They were also intended to provide the necessary nutrition for soldiers in the field. Early iterations of British ration packs actually used cans. It wasn't until the 1990s that these were replaced with pouches. Each MRE typically contains around 1,200 to 1,300 calories, with balanced nutrition essential to supporting the demands placed on soldiers during military operations. Each MRE is said to have approximately 170 grams of carbohydrates, 45 grams of protein, and 50 grams of fat. As we've said, a British ration pack is usually designed for 24 hours worth of nutrition, whereas it seems as if the American ones are not. We can assume this because the average nutritional value of an entire British ration pack is somewhere between 3,800 and 4,200 calories. Now here's a chili meal from before. We're gonna go through its specific nutrition. Now I wanna point out that the bag didn't have anything on it, so I am learning about the nutrition of these in real time. The chili with the beans, one serving size, all this is 260 calories. And this single serving of cornbread with your chili, also 260 calories. Your vegetable cracker is gonna be 170 calories, and your cheesy spread is 120 calories. Then the cheese-filled crackers, the pepperoni pizza flavor, 240 calories for this one. And if you're gonna be sipping on your lemon lime flavored and non fruit juice juice, that's gonna be 130 calories for the whole beverage. A grand total of this many calories. We've selected some items which seem to match up roughly with what you'd expect to find in a US MRE. Here we have the chili con carne main, we've got some crackers with the cheese spread, some peanut butter, and a fruit flavored drink. The total calories for these items comes to 1,379. The FDA recommends that adults consume around 75 to 90 milligrams of vitamin C per day. Just two of these drink sachets is more than enough vitamin C for that intake. We are not getting scurvy anymore. We learned our lessons back in the Navy days. Although it's also worth noting the amount of sugar that is in one of these. In a 45 gram sachet of mango and passion fruit drink, you will find 40.5 grams of sugar. That's 81% of your daily recommended intake just in one of these. Let's take a look at the ingredients of the chili con carne in the UK. Beef, red kidney beans, tomato puree, water, onion, red and green peppers, wheat flour, calcium carbonate, iron, thiamine and nicotinamide, modified maize starch, salt, spices, spice extracts, calcium carbonate and smoke flavor. The ingredients in here are actually all pretty natural without any real artificial preservatives. Our eyebrows were raised when we saw nicotinamide in the wheat flour. Thankfully, it's not some kind of nicotine, it's just another type of vitamin B3, aka niacin. This chili with beans contains all this. Uh, looks like mostly normal stuff until you get to the bottom of the list there. Ethoxylated monodiglycerides, I have no idea what that is. I don't think I've ever had that in Food Wars before, so uh, if someone in editing can go ahead and say what it's used for. These have a minimum shelf life of three years depending on storage conditions. Uh, the storage conditions for these MREs, I'm assuming were room temperature the whole time, so I'm feeling pretty confident that these are all uh, not expired. Similarly, ours have a shelf life of around three years, and after that, it's down to the temperature at which they're stored. For example, this chili was made in December 2021, and apparently is shelf stable until around 2025. And how can these meals have such a long shelf life, you ask? According to the USDA, MREs are shelf stable because they have been commercially sterilized by heat in a sealed container to destroy bacteria that can make it unsafe or spoil the food. Like food in metal cans, MREs can be kept for a long time, but not indefinitely. The shelf life of MREs and ration packs is pretty directly related to the temperature at which they're stored. The cooler the storage temperature, the longer they'll last. Rations in a desert temperature might only last a few months, whereas rations at room temperature or colder climates can be good up to five years. We're filming this towards the end of 2023, which means that our chili con carne, for example, is already around two years old. I've got to say, I don't feel great after eating them. However, I do think that's probably more due to the quantity that I've eaten rather than due to the storage quality of these. Since 1981, the US menu has changed about five times, improving the quality and the taste. It also has expanded the menu variety and now includes vegetarian, kosher, and halal options. There also aren't many changes in the UK. However, there was a recent controversial change. Chocolate bars were taken away from British troops serving in Iraq and Afghanistan because they kept melting in the desert heat. They were replaced with the much less popular peanut butter. I can see how people would be annoyed about that. From portion sizes to exclusive flavors, we wanted to find out all the differences between Prime in the US and the UK. This is Food Wars.
Let's start with Prime Hydration. In the UK, it comes in a 500 milliliter bottle. You can either buy this as a single bottle or as part of a 12 pack. In the US, our hydration also comes in one size, the 16.9 fluid ounce bottle or 500 milliliters. You can get it options of one bottle, an eight pack, which you did not get, sorry, the 12 pack, and a 15 pack variety. We also have Prime Energy, which in the UK comes in a 330 milliliter can. Just like Prime Hydration, this either comes as a single can or as part of a 12 pack. In the US, Prime Energy is a 12 fluid ounce can or 355 milliliters, and it comes in a single can, the 12 pack, and a 24 pack. In the US, our biggest Prime Hydration single item by volume is this, the 15 drink variety pack. Total fluid volume, 253.6, fluid ounces or 7,500 milliliters. Our largest size is a 12 pack of bottles, which adds up to six liters of Prime, but that's still 20% less than the biggest size in America. And if we go on energy drink, uh, 24 cans of these energy drinks. This is 288 fluid ounces or 8,520 milliliters. Our biggest Prime Energy item is again the 12 pack, but remember that our cans are slightly smaller than America's. A 12 pack of Prime Energy in the UK adds up to 3,960 milliliters. That's 53.5% smaller than the biggest size in America. Here are almost all of the exclusive Prime products you can get in the US you can't get in the UK. And here are all the Prime drinks you'll find in the UK, but not in the US. There aren't any, sorry guys. There are currently seven flavors of Prime Hydration available in the UK. However, all of them are available in the US as well, so none of them are actually exclusive. That said, there are some subtle differences in ingredients when it's compared to the US, and also I've never had Prime before, so I wanna try all of these, give you my thoughts, and maybe rank them as well. Here are currently three of the four Prime Hydration drinks you can get in the US, you can't get in the UK. So we got the lemonade, we got orange, we have this LA Dodgers flavor that might be just specific to Los Angeles. And there's a grape flavor couldn't get my hands on. Yeah. And here are all the other flavors you get in the US. Let's we'll start down here, lemon lime. I mean, this is, they're just going into after Gatorade on this one. Wasn't it the first Gatorade flavor, lemon lime? Really sweet, wow, that's really sweet. Ice pop, but also this looks like they have different names, but I grew up calling them bomb pops. I feel like I'm like tasting the cherry in this one. I think everyone who's tried these has said it. These are very sweet, but I mean, I'm kind of surprised I mean, it's marketed towards kids. Another thing I wanted to point out is that I was able to find ice pop flavors, both in the UK version and the US version. We're gonna get more into ingredients a little bit later on, but I'll do a very quick taste to see if there's any notable differences. We'll start with the UK one, and then we'll try the American version. The flavors are broadly the same, but the way that this one kind of like hits your taste buds it's very different and it's really weird. When you consume a drink, obviously you like, you wanna feel like your thirst has been quenched. You take a sip and there's something in here that's like actually kind of like drying my mouth out almost. I think if I had to pick which ones to prefer, it is gonna be the UK's and I'm not just saying that from bias. Wait, tropical punch. Okay, not... What the f Ugh. All right, well, that's pretty embarrassing. Hope nobody's watching this. I do like that. I, no, no kidding, they're getting progressively better as we go through. Can't screw up orange. Mmm. Yeah, this might be my favorite one. This is really good. And this doesn't feel as sweet as the other ones, or am I just getting used to it? Like like how your eyes adjust to the dark, I think my tongue's adjusting to the sweetness. So of the many sports teams in the world that have some sort of deal with Prime, LA Dodgers is one of them. Yeah, I'm seeing people on eBay bidding a lot for these, so. Straight up, I don't know what flavor this is, but it's good. Do you want to try it? My lips did touch it. Is it too weird? I mean, we have a professional relationship. Oh my God, this is so sweet. Oh no, I've gotten used to it. This is a good lemonade. As far as lemon flavored, not carbonated beverage, pretty good. I was also able to get my hands on one of the American exclusives, the lemonade flavor. I'm interested to try this because the US and the UK do have slightly differing ideas of what lemonade is. Obviously in the UK, we consider generally lemonade to be like a carbonated clear beverage, like a Sprite. Whereas in America, it's usually just kind of like lemon juice, sugar and water combined. So it does taste a bit like you've let like a, a Sprite kind of go flat. You can probably keep this one for the time being guys. Glowberry. It is supposed to glow in the dark. The, the, the label, not the beverage. What the hell? Yeah, I think that's the worst one. That's really weird. Meta Moon, what is the vibe of this? What about this says like, oh, that's so refreshing. This tastes the way uh, sunblock smells. Strawberry watermelon, All right? Back to things I've heard of. 
No, this tastes exactly like gum bubble -ish. just like one of, those one of those like really fruity ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna start down this end with the glowberry flavor. Now I did have to Google this to see if glowberries were an actual berry or not. As far as I can tell, they are not. I think it generally refers to a berry flavor and also the fact that the bottle is supposed to glow in the dark. I think we should put that to the test. Charlie, hit the lights. <laughs> not really glowing, is it? <laughs> My first taste of Prime, and it's not blown my socks off to say. It's just a very artificial berry flavor, got a bit of tang to it. Next up, we've got strawberry watermelon. I like that. The flavor I get from that is almost more like a kind of blue Powerade type flavor. According to the label, the ice pop flavor is supposed to taste like cherry, lime, and blue raspberry. Yeah, I mean, so far the vibe I'm getting is that they just taste kind of artificial fruit. But I think in terms of like balancing the flavors, this one's done a pretty good job so far. Maybe the most uh, delicately balanced flavor of the lot. Next up, we've got Meta Moon. Obviously, I don't know what the moon tastes like, and I don't know what the Meta tastes like right now either. If there were a Food Wars Meta, yellow number five would be S tier right now. Label just says this is candy flavored, which doesn't fill me with confidence because like, which candy? <laughs> tastes like Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> oh, it doesn't taste like a smell. No. <laughs> like at least these ones have had like a fairly identifiable fruity flavor, whereas this one is just kind of like generic sweet thing. Then we're on to blue raspberry. And one thing that's immediately stuck out to me is the color. I think I was actually expecting this to be like a more bright blue color. <laughs> it's actually just kind of white. It's quite a gentle blue raspberry. I want a bit more acidity from that, I think, but it goes down very smoothly. I do feel like I'm giving Prime way too much credit here. I'm swilling it around in a glass like I'm a sommelier. Yeah, maybe if we had a decanter, I could pour it out, let it breathe a little bit. I'm drinking too much Prime. I'm gonna be hydrated as hell. I'm getting hopped up on Prime. I need to go do like a celebrity boxing match or something. Yeah, Joe, you down? You and me in the ring, the full 12 rounds. I actually don't know who'd win that. I don't know the fight between me and Joe. You back me? Charlie backs me. Harry's vibe is very like, they're really like always just like calm and reserved or whatever, but that kind of like, that sarcasm that they have over there to me says that they're like, something's going on underneath the surface that they're suppressing. So Harry Stokes was the type of guy that if he got like into a fight fight, he would like, just like black out and then come to at like in the middle of a field at midnight with a shovel covered in blood with a corpse in his trunk. I'll box him as long as it's supervised. <laughs> Moving swiftly on from me and Joe fighting. Next up, we've got Tropical Punch Prime. Woo. So while I was out in the US recently, I was able to try Hawaiian Punch, and that's basically exactly what I'm getting from this. And then finally, we've got the Lemon Lime flavor. Of all of these flavors, this is the one that tastes the most like it supposed to. If I had to rank them, I think I'd do it in the following order. I think my least favorite, probably Meta Moon right in the middle here. Meta Moon is down there. I think with Ice Pop, they've just tried to combine a bunch of flavors that don't necessarily work together very well. So I think it's actually gonna be my second to last. I think Blue Raspberry is gonna come next for me and they lose points because I didn't even try and color it. I think next is gonna be Glowberry. The bottle didn't really glow. So maybe uh, leave it in the sun for a bit longer if you're gonna try that at home. I think next up, we're gonna have Tropical Punch. My number two is Lemon Lime, which means that my number one Strawberry watermelon. My favorite is the orange. In second place, I like the Dodgers flavor. Actually, I didn't think about it. I'm gonna go here, yeah. The lemon is good. And from here on, ice pop, eh. I mean, yeah, lemon lime. These, these are all like, I'd grab any one of these. These three, I say skip. A little bit of flavor tweaking or balancing might go a long way. I think with some of these, you wanted like maybe a bit more tang to them, a bit more acidity maybe dial back the sweetness on one or two as well. I don't know if I would necessarily pick a Prime over a classic energy drink like a Powerade, but I do think in general, if I wanted a sports drink and I went into a store and this was all they had, I think I'd still be happy to buy one. Like they're all fine and they kind of do that same job. Next up, let's take a look at Prime Energy. Now, while the Prime Hydration drinks are similar to maybe like a Powerade, these are much more similar to a classic energy drink like a Red Bull. There is one exclusive energy drink flavor in the US you can't get in the UK. It is the original that just was announced this week, couldn't get it. Anyway, here are the rest. Yes, the UK also has them. Most of them are similar to the hydration flavors, but there is a new one, orange mango. I'm a bit apprehensive about trying these because I don't drink energy drinks. I don't even drink coffee, I only drink tea. And I think one of these contains about as much caffeine as three cups of tea. So we'll start with ice pop. Chin chin. I think that does mirror the flavor of the 
hydration drink pretty closely, but I will say it tastes better than like a standard Red Bull flavor. Strawberry watermelon. I think there might be a theme here. They just kind of taste like fizzy versions of that. Here's the new one, orange mango. I get mostly mango. I'm not getting much orange from that. Yeah, not far off like a Rubicon. Tropical punch is up next. Yeah, I think that one's actually improved by becoming an energy drink. Lemon lime. You could give me a glass of that and a glass of Sprite and I'd struggle to tell the difference, I think, because it is just, again, like a carbonated lemon and lime beverage. Blue raspberry. I actually think for a few of these, just carbonating them has actually made them better. I think notably that was the case with the Tropical Punch and also to a degree, I think, Blue Raspberry. One I could not get at the time of filming this was the Ice Pop Strawberry Watermelon. It's like sweet and tart. Orange Mango. Uh, somehow worse. Uh oh, so far not good. Tropical Punch, okay. Yeah, this one's good. One and lime. Oh, yeah, it's pretty good too. Kind of looks right. Blue raspberry. Ooh. Nah. Yeah, it's also like a tart flavor to it, that. Not that I do. So I think I'm gonna rank it like this. Favorite was lemon lime. Really enjoyed the fruit punch. Blue raspberry is like in the middle. And then these two I wouldn't get. I guess, wow, apparently the strawberry watermelon flavor. I'm just not digging. Now for the orange mango, which was the worst, something about it just tastes like an armpit. Ice pop, did not like that one, I'm afraid. Orange mango, fine, but a bit too artificial, and there are, I think, better, like, fizzy mango drinks out there in the UK. Tropical Punch and Blue Raspberry were both improved, I think, by making them fizzy. But I think, just in terms of, like, flavor balance, strawberry watermelon, undefeated. One thing I will say about Prime Energy is that so far, when I've been tasting these, I feel like on the very rare occasions when I drink, like, a Red Bull or a Monster, they have kind of like a very distinct flavor to them. And even if you add flavorings to that, it's hard to mask it completely. Whereas I don't really get like a kind of distinct energy drink flavor throughout all of these. Most of them actually do just kind of taste like fizzy versions of the hydration drink. I think it's actually quite impressive. I think you probably could drink them almost as a soda. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I do think there's still some room for improvement with the flavors themselves. I think particularly down this end, of course, but in general, I think they've done a pretty good job with the flavors. One product that we have exclusively here in the US are these Prime Hydration Plus sticks. These are like the hydration flavors we had, but in powder form. I think you can get it in almost every single flavor. I got two for six of the crowd. Got six sticks. Okay. I mean, it looks lemon limey too. I guess probably you're supposed to shake it up and that's why you do a water bottle in a cup. Cause like, look, it's all like globulating at the top here. Oh, very strong. I think I could have cut it with more water, but. Oh God. Yeah, it's pretty close. I mean, this is obviously stronger cause it's not as much water. Sadly, the Prime Hydration Plus sachets have not hit UK shelves just yet. Although I can't say I'm too mad about that. I feel like just buy the drink, it's fine. The price of Prime can vary wildly depending on where or when you are looking. On the official UK website, a 12 pack of Prime Hydration sells for £24.99. That's around $31.82. The per bottle cost on the website, therefore, is just over £2. In the US, that same pack is $29.99, or £23.56. So, not much of a price difference. If you're not aware, Prime is a brand of hydration and energy drinks promoted by the influencers Logan Paul and KSI. The two have amassed a huge fan base online through various ventures on YouTube, in podcasting, music, and even wrestling. Now, Prime is manufactured by Congo Brands, a company based out of Louisville, Kentucky. Paul and KSI are the primary spokespeople for the brand. When Prime launched over a year ago, with KSI and Logan Paul putting their celebrity weight behind the promotion of the brand, it was a huge success. However, due to the popularity of the drink, a huge reselling market has emerged. Prime came to the UK in June 2022 and was an immediate smash hit. On release, Brits saw teenagers queuing up outside supermarkets all morning to try and get their hands on some. Places like Asda sold out so quickly that they had to implement a three bottle per customer limit. Convenience stores realized they could buy Prime in bulk and flip individual bottles for a huge markup. Some, such as the TikTok famous Wakey Wines, achieved infamy when they were caught selling bottles or cans for as much as £100 each. KSI even had to step in at one point and scold resellers, saying that it was not ethical. Uh, it wasn't as bad over here. It did fly off the shelves for a little bit, but I think it might have something to do with the resale value of these online was pretty good. I've never seen anyone drinking it, and to be honest, I got everything at Target uh, and online, kind of no problem. Now, currently, the LA Dodgers limited edition bottles are pretty pricey on eBay. I'm assuming, once again, that has more to do with its scarcity than its taste. 
Even now, as we film this in October 2023, the prime market hasn't exactly calmed all the way down. For some of the more standard flavors, the supply has now caught up with demand, and you're able to find them in most supermarkets for the standard retail price. For example, I was able to find the bottle of strawberry watermelon in Tesco for just £2. However, for some of the more exotic flavors, the only places you can find them are specialist candy shops, or niche resellers. The only place I could find my bottle of Glowberry was at one of those weird American candy stores which plague central London. This one bottle cost me 18 pounds. I wouldn't have paid 18 pounds for a bottle of Prime, but you did expensive, so you didn't pay for it either. What is the most I would realistically pay for a bottle of Prime Hydration? I don't know, five bucks? You think five is high? How much would you pay? I've just been informed $5 is too high. 150, you can't get anything for 150. What are you talking about? Fine. I would pay as much as Gatorade and Powerade and all the other aids are for this. It's hard to find empirical evidence as to whether or not the craze around Prime has kind of died down, but just from anecdotal evidence, I really don't think it has. Even when I was out buying the Prime for this episode, I would see kids in the stores just taking selfies with bottles of Prime like it was a celebrity. I think due to the scarcity and the demand, it's almost become like a status symbol among certain generations of kids. It's a race to see who can get the new flavors of Prime the fastest, People will, I guess, empty them out and just use them as like water bottles when they go to school. And again, it's just kind of like a way to flex on your peers. Besides converting their massive fan bases into loyal customers, KSI and Logan Paul have also been able to translate this into commercial partnerships. Prime is now an official drink supplier of the UFC, the LA Dodgers, and Arsenal, of which I believe KSI is a fan. And they're also the official sports drink partners of FC Barcelona and FC Bayern Munich. We've seen other influencers capitalize on their success in the food and beverage space. Mr. Beast, of course, has Beast Burger and his chocolate bars Feastables. Emma Chamberlain has her coffee brand, Chamberlain Coffee. Now, according to Paul, in the first year, the brand has cleared 250 million in retail sales. Goodness. Here are all the ingredients for a prime hydration ice pop flavor in the UK. These are the US hydration ice pop ingredients. The ingredients are pretty similar overall. The UK has slightly more coconut water, 10.5% compared to America's 10%, but ours is actually reconstituted from a powder, whereas America's is from concentrate. Prime hydration in both countries boasts zero added sugar, but does contain artificial sweeteners, sucralose and acylflame, no, I said it, acylflame, K or ACE K. According to the Center for Science in the Public Interest, ACE K raises health issues such as cancer, hormone disruption, and potential pregnancy risks. Per Healthline, there is also evidence suggesting that acetoacetamide, a compound formed in the body during the breakdown of ACE K, may result in thyroid damage in lab animals. Now, ironically enough, the lack of sugar may be an issue for the very purpose of prime hydration. Electrolytes play a crucial role in making sure your body functions properly. When you exercise or play hard, you sweat, you lose not just water, but you also lose important electrolytes. Electrolytes are key to hydration, and Prime does contain electrolytes like magnesium and potassium. But the low amount of glucose may impair your body from properly absorbing the electrolytes, as glucose is useful in transporting them to your cells. Typically, you don't need glucose to absorb electrolytes, but it does help. Prime Energy is currently in hot water with the media as well as the US government because of its perceived excessive levels of caffeine. Here in the UK, our Prime Energy cans contain 140 milligrams of caffeine. To put that into perspective, a grande coffee from Starbucks contains around 136. Energy cans in the US, however, contain 200 milligrams of caffeine, which is a 42.9% increase from the UK can. Because of this, Prime is currently experiencing a significant amount of backlash, resulting in some shops actually pulling it from shelves in order to protect kids' health. In July of this year, Senator Chuck Schumer called for an FDA probe of Prime and said it was a cauldron of caffeine that posed serious health concerns for kids. One Prime Energy contains 200 milligrams of caffeine, which is about as much caffeine in a six pack of Coke. It says it right there on legally the smallest font you could put it in. However, looking at the caffeine amounts of some other drinks currently on the market in the US paints a slightly different picture. Let's be clear, 200 milligrams in this can is a lot of caffeine. Pound for pound, it contains more caffeine than Monster Energy or Red Bull. But other American drinks such as Bang Energy or Celsius Heat contain 300 milligrams per can. That's 50% more than Prime. We don't have these in the UK. I'd never heard of Bang or Celsius Energy and they sound terrifying. One distinction that Senator Schumer is highlighting is that Prime is aimed at a kid's market, despite the fact that the can says not for children under the age of 18. Now, if that is the case, Prime still isn't the biggest offender. G Fuel, a brand that appears to also appeal to kids, specifically in the gaming space, has several drinks with 300 milligrams of caffeine. Think of flavors like rainbow sherbet, snow cone, hype sauce, 
that contain more caffeine than a prime, as well as celebrity branded flavors from PewDiePie and someone or something called One Shot Girl, both have 300 milligrams of caffeine in the can. Where's the outrage for that? A bottle of Ice Pop Prime Hydration in the US contains all of this. In the UK, a bottle of Ice Pop Prime Hydration contains the following. So in the UK, our Prime has slightly more calories, but less sodium. If you grab yourself a Prime Energy, I have the lemon lime flavor, it contains all of this. In the UK, the same drink, albeit in a slightly smaller can, contains the following. So it's almost identical to America's, although we have a little bit more sodium. From exclusive items to portion sizes, we wanted to find out all the differences between Chinese takeout in the US and the UK. This is Food Wars. Here are all the menu items you'll find in a UK Chinese takeaway that you might not find in the US. Here is all of the Chinese takeout we got at our local spot that you might not be able to find in the UK. We'll start with the appetizers. In the UK, it's pretty common when you order a Chinese to order a few starters and you kind of eat them alongside your meal. One thing to point out, almost all of these are beige and I think that's gonna be a bit of a theme as we go throughout this episode. A lot of British Chinese food is just kind of beige fried stuff and we love it. We'll start with an exception to the beige rule with crispy seaweed. It's actually got a misleading name because this isn't seaweed. It's shredded cabbage, which is then deep fried. It's always aggressively salty. Sometimes you get a little bit of kind of like fish flakes sprinkled on top. I think this one is basically just fried cabbage with some salt powder on it. When we had a Chinese takeaway at home, it would pretty much be the only green thing on our plates. And here's what we got for our exclusive appetizers, starting with the steamed dumplings. That's so good, I love a dumpling. Another pretty iconic starter is a chicken satay skewer. They will take a piece of chicken, put it on a skewer, grill it up in a kind of satay sauce, which is mostly peanuts, and then serve it to you there. We also have a bit of additional satay sauce for dipping as well. These are great. They're always like a little bit dry. I think that's why you have to have the sauce on the side as well. Next we have the scallion pancake, which literally looks like a cut up little pancake. I'm gonna take a taste. Yeah, it's really tasty. I wanna dip this in something though. I'm like getting the urge to dip. When I think of a British Chinese takeaway, this might be one of the main dishes that comes to mind. These are sweet and sour chicken balls. So the sweet and sour bit actually just refers to the sauce that it's served with. It's basically just a piece of chicken, which is then battered and deep fried. Mm -hmm. Now these vary in quality a lot from restaurant to restaurant. If chicken balls aren't your thing, then we also have the option of a prawn ball. Now instead of a piece of chicken, they take an entire prawn, batter it and deep fry it. Kind of like a tempura prawn, but I think a lot heavier on the batter. We've been locked in a debate here as to if there's any difference between prawn and shrimp. It seems like sometimes they're used interchangeably, but maybe they are actually different species. I don't know if Nico, you have any thoughts on uh, the differences between prawn and shrimp. There is actually a difference between shrimp and prawns. It's not just linguistic. Shrimp are more common in the US and tend to be smaller with a more savory flavor when compared to prawns. Charlie is saying that when he's had it in the past, it's been like a sort of prawn paste mashed up into a ball. Whereas these ones are just whole prawns inside some batter. So I feel like I've got a better deal here. This is a fried wonton. It's so cute, it looks like a little flower. That is so good and crunchy. Next up, I did want to take a look at British wontons. I know you can get these in America, but I thought there might be some differences. So these ones are not crispy, these are steamed. Pretty tasty, not something that I would commonly order. Moving on, we have the crab rangoons. These are like kind of a meme now for some reason. I don't know why these have like a spike in popularity just like in general, but this is what they look like. Kind of similar to a wonton, but bigger. Let's crack this bad boy open. Oh, gorge. The filling is just crab and cream cheese. I get it, I think. I get why it's so popular. This is a banger. When you talk about your beige food, Mount Rushmore, this has got to be up there. This is sesame prawn toast. You have four beige foods immortalized forever in stone. Now, if you order a full English breakfast in the UK, you're likely to find some fried bread on there. Basically what Chinese restaurants in the UK have done is elevate fried bread by putting a layer of prawn paste in the middle and then topping it with loads of sesame seeds. These are delicious, I love these. Moving on, we have the spare ribs. I have to admit, I've never had a spare rib. It's not something I've ever ordered. These have bones. That's literally a bone. I thought I ordered the boneless spare ribs, but I guess I ordered the spare ribs with the Peking duck sauce and they look and smell amazing. So I am gonna take a bite anyway. 
Yeah, that's literally so good. That is so good. Why don't I order ribs? <laughs> that's so yummy. Now, I was shocked when I saw these as an exclusive in this episode, but our next one is prawn crackers. These are another thing that you'll see on pretty much every UK Chinese takeaway order. Even if you don't order them, often they'll just throw you in a bag for free. They're just great for like mopping up bits of sauce or something. You can also dip them in the sweet and sour sauce and you kind of get this crackling. I really almost hope that we've made a mistake in this script and that you can in fact find these on Chinese takeout menus in the US because they're great and you guys are missing out. The last two items we wanted to talk about were chips. We have two versions here that you'll find on pretty much every British Chinese takeaway menu. We have regular chips and we have salt and pepper chips. As I'm sure some of you might know, British people don't tend to have the most adventurous palates in the world and there's usually a lot of demand for chips. Same with Indian restaurants and Chinese restaurants. Basically, they're just catering to the demand of the British public. Also, it's very common to pay your chips with curry sauce. So curry sauce in this sense, it probably has some of the similar flavorings that you would find in like a katsu curry type sauce. I would refer to this type of curry sauce as like chip shop curry sauce. And that kind of applies to whether it's Chinese takeaways or fish and chip shops. Then we also have the salt and pepper chips. Now salt and pepper seasoning is quite common at Chinese restaurants in the UK. That refers to a seasoning mix, which is comprised of salt, white pepper, and Chinese five spice. They kind of take that, base it around it. They'll make chips, cook them most of the way, and then finish them usually in a wok with some chili peppers, some onion, and some spring onion. These are delicious. Now I will defend salt and pepper chips, but they were kind of at the center of that TikTok controversy around British Chinese food, which honestly is kind of why we've made this episode. I also got an order of fries. Obviously these are not an exclusive just to US Chinese takeout places, but I just wanted to show what they looked like here versus in the UK. Very bland. I don't even think these have salt on them, which is kind of interesting. This is definitely one of those Chinese takeout menu items that feels very catered to a different kind of palette. I would say that I do not see people ordering french fries pretty much ever from a Chinese food place. Something like this is probably for like kids who are picky eaters, which I definitely was. I was ordering white rice and chicken wings from Chinese takeout as a child because I didn't wanna try anything else, but that's what this feels like. Something to please the children. I'm calling Harry a child right now. <laughs> Something to please the child. <laughs> Another British Chinese takeout staple is a crispy aromatic duck pancake. Now it sits somewhere kind of between an appetizer and a main course, because I mean, if you gave me enough of this, I would just eat that as my main. It can be kind of expensive, so I feel like some people just get a little bit to share. So it was neatly packaged for us, but it comes in a few different components. Obviously we have the crispy aromatic duck itself. These little crispy bits of skin are amazing. We have the pancakes. We have hoisin sauce, and then you have your vegetables. In this case, we have some julienne cucumber and spring onion. I'll, uh, I'll do a little demo assembly here. I feel like everyone's got different ways of assembling, so don't judge mine. Start with a pancake, get as much of that crispy skin as possible. A couple of bits of cuke, some sprunions. Hoisin is like kind of a plum-based sauce, so it's nice and sweet. Works really well with the savory. Have some fun with it, you know? Beautiful. These are sensational. I've not actually had one of these in a while. Next, let's talk about the exclusive soup options we have. This is vegetable bean curd soup. I should mention that I never order soup when I get Chinese takeout, but I, it's obviously gonna vary from person to person. Some people like a little soup appetizer. I'm not one of those people. Although I love soup in general. It mostly just smells like broccoli to me. It doesn't have a super strong flavor. I feel like the broth isn't as rich as I wanted it to be, but the tofu is really tasty. Next, we have the hot and sour. I've never had hot and sour soup before, so I am interested to try it. This smells a lot like sweet and sour sauce, so I assume that that's what's in here. I'm seeing vegetables, what I think is tofu. It smells really good, so let's take a little slurp. The texture is not my favorite. I think it's like got the texture of a sauce to me, so like sipping it like a soup doesn't feel right, but it does taste good. And lastly, we have the egg drop soup, which I feel like is a pretty popular soup when you're ordering Chinese takeout here. The one we got here is chicken and sweet corn, which I think is kind of like the archetypal Chinese takeaway soup here in the UK. I won't necessarily go out of my way to order one of these, although I do think they're pretty tasty. One thing to point out though is the texture of these, because if you're not used to it, it can really take you by surprise. There's something about a chicken and sweet corn soup 
in particular that's just so comforting. We actually do have a corn and chicken soup here too. I just don't think it's as popular as something like a hot and sour soup. In the UK, we have a lot of fried rice dishes. These probably could be ordered as your main meal, but I would say in the UK, they're more traditionally ordered alongside a meat or a vegetable dish and kind of enjoyed together. We picked out a couple of options. Here is the house special fried rice. And then also we have the Singapore fried rice. I just wanted to find out what makes this the house special fried rice because usually it will include a variation of kind of things mixed in with it. There's little pieces of chicken, pork and prawn in here, as well as some spring onions. The Singapore fried rice seems to actually have the same fillings. I'm seeing these little tiny shrimps in them, I'm seeing bits of chicken and pork as well. But I think this is supposed to be a slightly spicier fried rice, so let me give this one a quick try. Not like overpoweringly hot, but definitely more of a chili kick to that one. Moving on to our fried rice option, we only have one, and this is the Young Chow fried rice. It's basically made with a bunch of different protein options. Looking down right now, I just see spare ribs, I see chicken, I see shrimp. Looks kind of good. I've never thought of eating multiple meats at one time like this. I would argue and say that fried rice in general is like a popular food here. I make it all the time, like it's such an easy dish to make at home and it's definitely popular at Chinese takeout places, but for some reason, we only had one exclusive option at this particular location. I'm gonna try to get a bite with every single meat on it. Oh, there it is. It is a very odd taste when it's three different meats at once, but it's not bad. It's actually pretty good. Now chow mein has to be one of the most popular dishes in the UK. I think surveys have actually placed it as the number one dish. It's pretty versatile. So usually, again, this would be an accompaniment to maybe like a meat dish as well, or you could kind of just eat this on its own. Personally, chicken chow mein is my favorite, and I think probably most Brits favorite too, but you can also just get plain, vegetable, or various other toppings. Here we have the chicken chow mein. It's effectively just a stir fried noodle dish. Chow mein definitely is a thing here. It just isn't a thing at this particular restaurant. I'm sorry, I have to repeat myself so much. Let's talk noodles. This is the pan fried noodle. This is the lo mein. And this is the Singapore mei fun. Opening this up, I knew exactly what it smelled like. It smells like curry, so there has to be some sort of curry element in it. It smells really good, so I think I'm gonna take a bite. I've never had this before. And it also looks like they use a smaller noodle than in either of these two dishes. It's like those thin, is it like vermicelli noodles? Vermicelli noodles. That's my daughter's name. <laughs> this dish also has multiple proteins going on. I'm seeing chicken and I'm seeing shrimp. I don't know if there's anything else underneath, but that's what I see right now. The flavor's pretty good. I don't know if I like vermicelli noodles. I think this is my first time having them. They're just such a thin noodle. I like something chewier, like the ones that come in the lo mein. Once you get past the rice and the noodle portions, the Chinese takeaway menus in the UK are usually categorized by protein. So you'll choose either chicken, pork, beef, or anything else, and then you kind of choose a sauce that goes with that. For example, we can get sweet and sour chicken, but you can also get sweet and sour pork and sweet and sour beef. From each protein category, we're gonna show you a couple of either interesting or unique food items. Let's start with chicken. Here I have lemon chicken. This is another one of those that's probably gonna be found on pretty much every Chinese takeaway menu in the UK. The sauce is pretty good though. It's lemony, a little bit sweet, a little bit tart. Then here we have the Kung Po chicken. You might also see this referred to as Kung Pao chicken with that A in the middle there, but it's the same dish. It's basically not too dissimilar to sweet and sour chicken that you might find on the menu at a UK Chinese takeout. It's these dredged and fried pieces of chicken in a sweet and spicy sauce. Kung Pao chicken, I think traditionally also would have some peanut in it. In the US, it's exactly the same. Our menus are categorized by the protein type, but a lot of the dishes are really different. So you don't always get the same sauce for say a seafood dish as you would a chicken dish. Let's start with the chop suey, which I have never had before, but I'm very interested. You can get it with any protein. We got ours with chicken. And here's what that looks like. The chicken looks a little pale. I feel like this is a surprisingly bland dish compared to a lot of other chicken dishes I've had from Chinese takeout. It's definitely not my favorite. Moving on to the sesame chicken. This was like a fan favorite. I was told I had to get this. I'm not a sesame chicken orderer, but my friends and coworkers are. Yeah, it's so good. Next we have orange chicken, which as the name suggests has orange in the sauce. And this particular place uses like the orange peel to like season the chicken. I've definitely had a lot of orange chicken in my day. 
particularly the frozen kind from Trader Joe's. So it is pretty popular. It's not a spicy sauce. It's definitely just like a sweet tangy sauce, but it's very delicious. And last but not least, we have General Tso's chicken, which is my personal favorite thing to order from Chinese takeout. You'll see it on a lot of Chinese restaurant menus here in the US, but it's not exactly authentic Chinese food. Shocker. General Sao was a real general from the Hunan province who supposedly enjoyed eating a dish similar to General Sao's chicken, although this modern American version would probably be unrecognizable to him. The dish was actually created in the 1950s by a chef named Peng Chang Kui. When he immigrated to New York in 1973, he altered his recipe to cater to the American palate, which in this case means he made it sweeter. Peng Chang Kui called it General Sao's chicken because he and General Sao are from the same town. Then we're on to the beef options. Now, firstly, I have to shout out what might be my favorite British Chinese takeaway dish, which is crispy shredded beef with chili. One thing I've got to say, talking a lot about textures and crispiness here, what you will often find from Chinese takeaways in the UK, they actually break a little hole in the plastic container. This is probably the first thing that I'm ordering when I'm ordering a Chinese takeaway. What they do is they get these little slivers of beef, dredge them usually in something like corn flour, fry them up, and then toss them in this lovely sweet and spicy chili sauce. I just love the variation you get. Like some of them will be slightly chewier, some of them will be crispier. Flavors are great. Next up, we have some Sichuan beef. Now, I really enjoyed hearing Tiaran talking about the Chinese Szechuan style flavors. of cooking with the peppercorn. When we were doing the US versus China series, go check that out. But I think Sichuan food tends to be pretty spicy. And they also use Sichuan peppercorns, which give you this kind of like numbing effect in your mouth. The beef here also isn't fried. It's more just like pieces of braised beef. I'm kind of intrigued to uh, give this a try, although I'm worried about my spice tolerance. Yeah, it's pretty spicy. It's very tasty, very flavorful. And then finally, we've got some beef and black bean sauce. I'd say this is a pretty common one as well. And this is one that you can also get in different meat varieties. So you can get this with the chicken, with the pork, anything else. Comes with loads of peppers as well. There's some chili in there, onions. It's a nice, like very rich sauce. That's really good. That with some rice. Beautiful pairing. We'll often actually get this one. This is one of my favorites. I feel like I've said that about a lot of things. I think I just ordered too much Chinese takeaway. There's a variety of beef dishes that you can get at Chinese food places here in America. Today, we got the Mushu beef. So it's got cabbage, some mushrooms, obviously the beef. Let's take a taste. The beef in that is really, really tender and delicious. I actually really like this. Seafood is also a pretty common option on UK Chinese takeaway menus. A lot of the options you will find have similar sources to some of the beef or pork options, but there are also a few unique ones as well. Firstly, we have salt and pepper squid. You might remember the salt and pepper chips from earlier. It's basically crispy squid cooked in that same seasoning. Sometimes this might be found under appetizers. Today, they had it in their main section, so we're going with that. I love crispy squid. The way that they kind of like cut it with this crosshatch pattern, particularly in Chinese cuisine, gives it a really nice texture. It's not that chewy. It's really flavorful, not super fishy. Just to illustrate that sometimes the sauces are the same in different parts of the menu, this is the pepper and black bean sauce again, but this time with squid. Then we have a couple of prawn options as well. Here we have the king prawns in oyster sauce and king prawns with cashew nuts. While we have the prawn here in its uh, unballed form, <laughs> let me get one of those out. Nico, how does that look? Is that a prawn or a shrimp? Or neither? That prawn kind of looks shrimpy to me. It certainly does not look like a king prawn. That's not the king of the prawns. In the US, shrimp is definitely the most popular seafood option when you get Chinese takeout. We have a couple of shrimp options here, the Szechuan shrimp and a seafood delight, which has shrimp in it. And I'm guessing other delightful sea creatures. That's just shrimp. Is that what is delightful? Or do they mean delight is like you get a bunch of veggies with it? Let's just try the Szechuan shrimp. It smells as spicy as I think it's gonna be. This is probably the biggest shrimp I've seen today. I swear I've eaten with a fork before. Oh no, it's tail on. It's spicy, not as spicy as I thought it was gonna be, but I'm sure the more you eat it, the spicier it gets. But that sauce is really, really good. And the shrimp is awesome, even though it's got tails on it. Take the tails off. We also got a shrimp egg roll. Harry really wanted me to try this and I'm glad he mentioned it because I've never had a shrimp egg roll before. Just pork, that's what I get every time. Do you see that one little tiny piece of shrimp? I feel like it tastes slightly different than the pork not just because the meat is different. Another item you'll see in a lot of Chinese restaurants in the US is egg foo young. It's an omelet made with vegetables, a protein and a stir fry sauce. Whoa, baby. This is a big omelet. It smells really good. It doesn't just smell like egg. It smells like a lot of good stuff. 
It needs a lot more salt, actually. I wonder if you're supposed to like add sauce or something on top. I think we're actually supposed to add this gravy to it. So let me add that and see if it helps with the salt factor. This feels very UK core right now. Me pouring this gravy all over food. Better? Still not great. I don't know if I like this. Yeah, egg for young is interesting, but I'm not sure British people would really be going in and kind of ordering just an omelet from a Chinese takeaway. I'm not sure how well that would take off over here. It's time for sauce talk. Sauce talk. If there was ever a time to do sauce talk, it's now. So in front of me here, I have all the sauces that were on offer at the restaurant we ordered from. I'm gonna go through them now, explain what they are, what they might be paired with, and give them a try. We'll start with a slightly infamous one. It's British curry sauce. The British went around the world, took spices from everybody, and this is somehow the only thing that we came up with. Brits love curry sauce, or at least this iteration of curry sauce. There's definitely like some heat there. Not a lot, it's quite a gentle spice flavor. There's something about the texture that is just really satisfying. That really gloopy, like cornstarchy texture goes excellently with chicken balls, You'll often see Brits drizzling this onto chips. Chips and curry sauce is a big thing in the UK. Or you'll just see it drizzled across your entire succulent Chinese meal. I will say Joe really loved that. When we did our fish and chip shop food tours episode, it's not just the Brits who can enjoy it. Then we have another iconic UK Chinese takeout sauce, which is sweet and sour. Depending on where you get it from, the color again will vary. It's a pretty well balanced one. The first thing that hits your tongue is the sour, then it pretty quickly mellows out and you get a nice sweet aftertaste. Again, I think this is kind of intended to be paired with the chicken balls or prawn balls or something else like that but I do think a lot of Brits will just kind of coat their entire meal in it. While we're on the subject of these iconic sauces, I also have to shout out the polystyrene cups. I think Americans might call that styrofoam, but these are really iconic. This is the standard delivery vessel for your sauces. The restaurant that we ordered from had two chili options. Firstly, we have sweet chili. Brits love sweet chili. This is on the menu at a lot of restaurants. And then the next one we have is chili oil. I'd say this one isn't super commonly found on like UK Chinese takeout menus. Next up we have the black bean sauce. Now this is the same sauce that you might have seen in some of the dishes earlier. Then we've got two more sauces. First up we have hoisin sauce. Now this is most commonly paired with the crispy duck that you'll find on UK Chinese takeout menus. It's a very thick, dark brown sauce. Again, gloopy sauces, we love it. I think the main ingredient in hoisin sauce or one of the main ingredients is plum. So you get this real sweetness from it, which works very well with the savory duck meat and other things on the menu. And then finally, we have barbecue sauce. Now, I was a little bit confused when I saw this on the menu because barbecue sauce in the kind of Western sense, so like a Texas barbecue sauce, for example, does not look like this. And I think that's what I was expecting. But I think what's actually been delivered is much more of a Chinese style barbecue sauce. What this one makes me think of is more when you eat like a char siu pork bun, for example, because while it is barbecue-y, it's still got some sweetness to it. There's Chinese five spice in here but if you're expecting like Heinz barbecue sauce, that's not it. I think out of all of these ones, the one I will reach for the most will be the sweet and sour sauce. It's because I'll almost always order the chicken balls when I'm making a Chinese takeout order in the UK and one of these will come with it. Yeah, I think in the UK, it's kind of just the definitive sauce, closely followed by curry. I think that's one of the biggest differences between Chinese takeout in the US and the UK. Our takeout comes with the sauce already incorporated for the most part. You do get a mix though of tiny little sauce packets like this. So we've got soy sauce, duck sauce, which is so good. It's kind of just like a sweet sauce. We have mustard usually, which I'm not seeing here, but you do get mustard and hot sauce. I'm pretty sure there are more, but that's just what we have right now. And then we have a couple little cups of, this looks like a paste. I think that this is a little tiny container of oyster sauce. And this is just a little container of extra soy sauce, probably for dipping. If you do not have a drawer full of these sauces, I don't know what you're doing. I feel like everybody has that drawer in their house that's filled with random sauce packets like this. Now that we've covered every item individually, what I wanted to do was show you my ideal plate of British Chinese takeaway food. You might've seen these on TikTok or elsewhere as these kind of broke the internet a while ago, but I'm gonna show you my version. I need some chow mein. The amount of carbs that might end up on this plate could be alarming to some, because we're gonna go noodles. We're also gonna go rice. You know we're gonna get the salt and pepper chips involved. Then I want a healthy portion of my crispy chili beef. I'm gonna want some seaweed on here, some of this prawn toast, definitely a couple of spring rolls, and of course our prawn crackers as well. So generally speaking, this is a pretty normal plate of Chinese takeaway food for a British person, but we're not done there. The final step, of course, is to add our sauces. Yes, that sauce is plural because we're gonna be adding both the curry sauce and the sweet and sour sauce to this. And honestly, I'm not discriminating here. This is going pretty much on the entire meal. And of course, our sweet and sour sauce. 
Love it or hate it, that is your typical plate of British Chinese takeaway food. I think I've done a pretty good job there. British people, please feel free to agree or disagree with me in the comments below. Nico, I've got to hear your thoughts about this. Would you eat this? Let me stop you right there. Why do you guys sauce the whole plate? Like, doesn't the whole plate just then taste like that sauce? You want everything to taste exactly like that sauce? Bone up the teeth. Now let's make up an American plate of Chinese takeout with a bunch of staple foods that I think are pretty nationally beloved, I would say. Let's start with our sides, our little appetizers. So we'd probably throw a couple of wontons on there. I'd also do some type of roll. I would usually do an egg roll, but all we've got left are spring rolls. Next, you'd have your rice. I prefer white rice. I just think it's really easy to pair with any sort of entree. Okay, I wouldn't normally eat the full container of rice, but we're gonna keep it on the plate. We gotta get some chicken. You definitely need a side of veg, so we're gonna do broccoli, because I feel like that's literally at every single Chinese restaurant, they have broccoli on the side. If you ignore the huge mountain of white rice, I think this looks pretty appetizing. The last thing I would add to this plate is probably some lo mein, so let's do that. I didn't mention these before, but these little fried, I think they're fried noodle pieces, they come with soups. So you can just throw them in your soup, have them with your soup. They're just good to snack on. I think this looks like a pretty appetizing plate. This is probably the point where folks in the UK would douse their plate in sauce. I would do things a little differently. I really like dipping egg rolls into the duck sauce, which is this one, it's so good. And some people put sauce, I think, over their rice and stuff. So we have our white rice, our wontons, our fried noodles, some spring rolls, a side of broccoli, sesame chicken, and the lo mein, which I think this kind of sums up what a typical order from a Chinese food place would look like here in America. If it doesn't look like what you would order, sorry, babe, I don't know what to tell you. This is just what I think. I can't even believe I didn't mention it yet. You have to get a can of Coke on the side. Any soft drink really will do. I just think you need a can of soda with your Chinese takeout. It's just, it's a sensation like no other. It's, it goes together. In the UK, when we order food to be delivered, we say we're ordering a takeaway rather than ordering takeout. Also in the UK, we tend not to bother adding the words food or takeaway to the type of food we're eating. For example, if we're ordering Chinese takeout, most Brits will just say that we're having a Chinese. Same applies for maybe Indian food when you have an Indian or even a full English breakfast. In the US, we call it takeout. They obviously both mean the same thing, but that's just our preferred way of saying it. We also say Chinese food or Chinese takeout rather than just a Chinese. We also wanted to look at how each country packages it's food. In the UK, you might find your Chinese food in one of these foil boxes with a paper lid. The other most common form of packaging is one of these clear plastic tubs. And then finally, for your appetizer options, such as some spring rolls, which we've got here, they generally will just come in a paper bag. I've always seen those folded cardboard boxes in American TV shows, and they do look pretty cool, I have to say. Also, the cute little takeout boxes are something that I feel like we see a lot maybe in media when someone orders Chinese food, but they're not super, super common. Mostly the food comes in these kinds of containers which is like a black Tupperware with a clear top. These are usually reserved for the rice, maybe the lo mein, but it's not reserved for like all of the food options. These boxes were actually inspired by Japanese origami. Frederick Weeks Wilcox was the first person to introduce the paper pail box in the 19th century to carry raw oysters. He created a patent for it and called it a paper pail, which it basically is. It's like a cute little pail. In the UK and the US, portion sizes and menu items will vary slightly depending on the different restaurants that you go to. But we did want to compare a couple of standard menu items in the US and the UK to see who might be getting bigger portions. One iconic appetizer from a Chinese takeaway in the UK is the spring roll. The restaurant that we ordered from serves these in a portion size of six. In the US, spring rolls are made a little bit differently. They're made with rice paper and they have thinly sliced vegetables on the inside. This particular Chinese restaurant only gave us two, but I have ordered from some places that give you more. It just depends on where you order from. We do have egg rolls, which are kind of similar to the UK. These come in only one size as far as I know, but depending on what place you order from, they could be like a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller than this. My local place, they're actually a little bit bigger than this size. In the UK, our egg fried rice only came in one size. I don't want to weigh this 
outside of the box. So I'm just gonna wear it in the box. This is a mountain. All of this rice just came out of this tiny little container. So this is what our fried rice looks like at this particular restaurant. They only had one size of this fried rice, but I have seen places do small and large sizes. All right, let's weigh this mountain of rice. It's like just maxed out the scales. That's a lot of rice. We do have chicken included in that, just letting you know. And we did weigh the plate beforehand, so that's not part of this weight. The restaurant that we ordered from had chow mein in two different sizes, regular and large. Although the large was only available with certain varieties. So this is a chicken chow mein regular size, and this is the house special chow mein in a large size. We do have chow mein here in America, but we didn't have it at this particular restaurant. We do have pan fried noodles, which I think are similar-ish, so we're gonna weigh these. Although I feel like it might once again be slightly too heavy for the scales. Moving on to sweet and sour chicken. That is like a tried and true classic with takeout. I think that I'm supposed to sauce it myself, which isn't the norm for me. In my experience getting Chinese takeout, everything is already like sauced. You don't need to add anything. This time they came without sauce. So we're just gonna add it ourselves. In the UK, our sweet and sour chicken came in one size. In the UK, this consists of little fried pieces of chicken, peppers, onions, and also pineapple. I'm getting word that I think I was supposed to dip the individual pieces into sauce and eat it like that. I've never ordered this. I just know it's a common takeout item here, but I already poured the sauce all over it. So let's just wait and see how much it is. As we mentioned before, each Chinese restaurant is unique as to how they prepare and cook their food, so it's kind of impossible to know exactly what's going into each dish. One ingredient that we did want to highlight, however, as it's commonly associated with Chinese food, is MSG, or monosodium glutamate. In 1907, a Japanese chemist named Kikunai Ikeda discovered a substance called glutamate, also known as umami. He later broke that substance down into MSG. MSG is a seasoning and food enhancer that gives a rich, savory flavor. MSG is actually very commonly found in fast foods, including Chick-fil-A, snack foods including Doritos and naturally occurs in some cheeses. MSG has been recognized as safe by the FDA several times and only contains a third of the sodium content of table salt. So why has it got such a bad rap? In 1968, the New England Journal of Medicine published a letter titled Chinese Restaurant Syndrome. In it, a doctor describes his experiences after eating at Chinese restaurants, citing symptoms like numbness in the back of the neck, general weakness, and palpitations. The blame was placed on MSG, and the Chinese restaurant syndrome myth quickly spread. The phrase even ended up in the Merriam-Webster dictionary. Despite there being no evidence that MSG was dangerous, there was still a public panic around it. Chinese restaurants in particular were deemed unhealthy. Thankfully, the use of MSG is much more normalized today, although the xenophobic misinformation from the 1960s does still linger. If you Google MSG, some of the suggested search terms include things like why are Americans afraid of MSG and is MSG a neurotoxin? Short answer, no it's not. The first Chinese restaurants to appear in the UK were called eating houses. They would serve Chinese sailors who would dock in British ports. This goes as far back as the 19th century when Hong Kong was part of the British Empire. Notable locations for this included Limehouse, which is part of the East End of London, and was actually where the original Chinatown was. The East End of London was particularly hit by bombing raids in the Second World War, which caused Chinatown to relocate to Soho, where it is today. The first recorded Cantonese restaurant in London was a place called Cathay, and it was opened in 1908. It was opened by a former ship's chef, a guy called Chung Kun. It was Chung Kun's son who opened a restaurant in Bayswater decades later, which might have been the kind of origin of the Chinese takeaway in London. Apparently, the food was so popular that if customers couldn't get a table, they would simply ask for the food to go. Chung Kun's restaurant Maxim had a very popular dish consisting of pork in a sweet and sour sauce called Jia Jiao. While the origins of the dish are specifically Cantonese, it just became known as Chinese food to Britons. The first known Chinese restaurant in the US was called Canton and opened in 1849 in San Francisco. The 1850s saw the appeal of the gold rush, so to escape worse conditions in China, there was a flood of Chinese immigrants in this time. Restaurants began popping up to feed Chinese workers who missed their cuisine from home, modifying their favorite dishes using ingredients that they could find in the US. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act forbade Chinese immigrants from coming to America. An exception was made for restaurateurs who could apply for merchant visas, which saw a boom in Chinese restaurants opening up in the 1910s. 
Any new restaurants that opened had to be considered high grade to be within the 1882 Act, so the owners lavishly decorated the restaurants, and by 1943, the Act was revoked. During this period, dishes such as chop suey and egg foo young were popularized across the country, especially the spread of chop suey houses. Chop suey was made from food scraps. Its name basically means leftovers. Male migrants who came over from China had little to no kitchen skills and ingredients were different from those back home, so they threw together what they could find, creating a dish that was very easy to make. Chop suey was a popular Chinese-American dish up until the 1960s, after which General Tso's chicken kind of became the new popular thing. Also during this time, Chinese food began to be preserved in cans for pickling and freezing because the Great Depression meant that people were looking for food that was more affordable. Popularizing the chop suey houses was a turning point for integrating Chinese cuisine into American culture, even if the dish was eventually less popular. Chinese food increased in popularity in the UK during and after World War II. Recipes for Chinese cakes, as well as other simple Chinese recipes, were introduced to Brits by the BBC. And as some Brits returned from being stationed in the Far East, they brought back with them a taste for Chinese cuisine. An influx of Cantonese immigrants arriving from Hong Kong in the 1950s brought with it a wave of Chinese restaurants to the UK. These restaurants really blew up in popularity. The restaurants grew so popular, in fact, that Billy Butlin introduced chop suey and chips to the restaurant menus at his holiday camps. One trend that you also saw was Chinese families taking over old fish and chip restaurants. This is why you still see things like fish and chips or battered sausage and chips on the menu at some Chinese restaurants. Around 1960, the Mandarin opened in San Francisco, introducing Americans to Chinese food beyond chop suey, like hot and sour soup and pot stickers. Cecilia Chang, the owner of the restaurant, wasn't sure what food customers would want, so she added over 300 items to the menu. President Nixon's trip to China in 1972 began to normalize relations between the countries, and Americans were influenced to try more Chinese food. In 1989, the National Restaurant Association concluded that Chinese food was actually the most frequently consumed cuisine across the country, and over the next few decades, the number of Chinese restaurants went up by the thousands. In 2007, there were over 43,000. In the U.S. today, there are over 23,000 Chinese restaurants. In the 1950s, there were only 36 Chinese restaurants in the UK, but the next few decades saw that number rapidly ascend. By the late 1990s, that number had risen to over 5,000. Today, there are a little over 7,000 Chinese restaurants up and down the UK. According to a survey, Chinese food is the second most popular cuisine in the US, right behind pizza, as of June 2023. A 2001 poll said that Chinese food was British people's favorite foreign cuisine. From exclusive items to portion sizes, we wanted to find out all the differences between Cadbury products in the US and the UK. This is Food Wars. In the UK, classic dairy milk chocolate comes in a bunch of sizes. The smallest one isn't sold individually, but it's one of these selection box bite-sized pieces. Then we move up to one of these little bars. These are sold mostly as a snack for children and they weigh 18 grams each. Then we have a multi-pack bar, which weighs 33.5 grams. Then we have what I would say is the standard bar, which is 45 grams. If you're feeling hungry, you can have a duo bar. As you can see by the crease in the middle, it's kind of separated into two smaller bars, and in total, it weighs 54.4 grams. In terms of standard dairy milk, you may also be able to find a 95 gram bar. We actually found a 90 gram bar of caramel milk. The portion size varies slightly depending on what type of chocolate you're getting. Moving more in towards the larger sizes, we have a 110 gram bar of dairy milk. Up from that, we have a 180 gram bar. Our second biggest size is this 360 gram bar. And finally, our biggest size is this one. That's 850 grams of dairy milk. In the US, our dairy milk bars come in one size, the 3.5 ounce or 99.2 gram bar. Now this bar right next to it, the Caramello, is actually four ounces, or 113.4 grams. Right here in the middle, there's a fruit and nut size that's 5.4 ounces, or 153 grams. I couldn't get it in time. Uh, but our, I guess, biggest size or other size is this, a bag of miniatures, where it is an eight ounce, or 22 gram bag. But it's always little guys in there. Our Cadbury bar, the 99.2 gram bar, comes in 18 squares per bar. If you divide it up, it's six grams per square. For comparison, we'll take a look at our 110 gram bar of dairy milk in the UK. One of these bars has 24 individual squares. We're gonna find out how much one of those weighs. So according to our slightly inaccurate analog scales, one square weighs around six grams, although if we divide the 110 figure by 24, we end up with around 4.5, so somewhere between there. So, there's no difference. Good on you, Cadbury. Here are all the Cadbury products from the UK that you won't find in the US. 
And here are all the Cadbury products from the US you won't find in the UK. This is gonna be an easy one for me. Now, I want to remind the audience that this is for Cadbury products produced in our respective countries. Yes, all this stuff is available on Amazon, we know. Now obviously we have a ton of exclusive products here in the UK, so we're gonna break them down into categories. We'll start with standard dairy milk bars, but with different flavorings. We're gonna start off with a bang here with what's possibly my favorite, just standard dairy milk bar, which is Cadbury Whole Nut. It's basically fruit and nut, but with none of that gross fruit in there. It's just the nuts. Fruit and nut, whole nut. Now depending on what time of year you're looking for your Cadbury in the supermarket, you might be able to find orange dairy milk, but because we're in the build up to the festive season, we got winter orange crisp instead. Chocolate and orange is kind of a beloved flavor combination here in the UK. I think a lot of people will think of Terry's chocolate oranges, but Cadbury's are getting in on the act too. Next up, we have Cadbury Dairy Milk Oreo. You might see a few of these as we go through. They seem to have some kind of partnership going on with Oreo, because there's actually quite a few Dairy Milk X Oreo products. I'll open this one up because it's actually quite cool what they've done to be fair. From the outside, it looks just like a standard piece of dairy milk, but if you see, they've actually filled it with Oreo cream. But they also put little pieces of the biscuit in, so you get these like crunchy bits as well. If the Cadbury Dairy Milk Oreo somehow isn't sweet enough for you, you can also get a white chocolate Oreo bar. We're sticking with the classics here, and we're moving on to Dairy Milk Caramel. Now I know I said that this might have been too sweet for me, but I actually do really like the caramel bars. So what you get is Dairy Milk chocolate, but then you have this quite liquidy caramel on the inside. The caramel, it is sweet, but it's not like, it's not like you're just tasting sugar, you know, there is something else going on there. We did see that in the US, you guys have caramello. Is that kind of the same thing? Joe, what do you think? Hi, Harry, and yes, we don't have the dairy milk caramel. We have the dairy milk caramello. I remember caramello for a while was a US brand. I remember the commercials. It went like, caramello. So that's yours, let's take a look at ours. Here's ours. It's already like kind of coming out there. It's caramel heavy, rich, I guess. Yeah, I can't got a, a straight answer. If Cadbury just bought Caramello in the US and repackaged it or what, but it looks like it's probably relatively the same. Sticking with the caramel theme, we now have the new salted caramel bar. I feel like, I don't know if this is the case in the US, but there's been a real salted caramel takeover in the past couple of years to the point where it's very hard to find unsalted caramel now. And I suppose Cadbury had to get on the trend. I really don't think I taste much, if any, difference at all between that and the regular caramel. Since I have nothing else to do for this episode, I'm gonna go ahead and try some of you, this UK Cadbury I'm hearing so much about, starting with the OG Cadbury Dairy Milk Bar. Mm, yeah. This is a much smoother, nicer, richer, creamier chocolate. I do really love this, it's fantastic. You brag a lot about your chocolate, UK, but another thing you should be bragging about is your caramel. It's also really good and way better than what we have in America. So the caramellos from earlier, I just not, not the, not the biggest fan of those anymore. I liked them when I was a kid, but caramel in America is just too, yeah. But yours, oh yeah. I mean, pulls apart nicer. Now this one got cheers of approval from the crew when I mentioned it. This is the Cadbury Dairy Milk Dime Bar. Now for those who don't know, Dime is a chocolate bar in its own right, and it's like a layer of chocolate on the outside with quite a hard layer of kind of toffee caramel on the inside. Now Dime bars themselves, I think, have maybe fallen out of favor a little bit in the UK. They were very popular with kind of like my granddad's generation, and I think people don't really buy them on their own anymore. However, I do say they are delicious. You can also still buy them in places like Ikea. I think they're popular kind of on continental Europe. Next up, we have another new bar. It's the Cadbury White Confetti Bar. I've never seen this before, before I went to do the shopping for this episode, but it's white chocolate and it contains oat biscuit pieces as well as milk chocolate beans. But you do see quite a few of these biscuity pieces. Ooh. Yeah, I get a lot of the biscuit, not much of the chocolate pieces. You may also be able to find a mint dairy milk, a crunchy pieces dairy milk, and also dairy milk with 30% less sugar, but I wasn't able to try them down today. Then we have a couple of dairy milk bars with either slightly different compositions or flavors. Firstly, we have Dairy Milk Marvelous Creations. This one has jelly popping candy inside. Don't quote me on this, but I feel like back in the early 2000s in the UK, we had a Wonka series of chocolate bars, which were inspired by Willy Wonka. Now, I think that was actually a Nestle product, but 
they had interesting flavors. They did things like putting jelly beans and popping candy into their chocolate bars. They've disappeared, don't know what happened to them. But I feel like this is Cadbury's attempt to like get in on that, bring that back a little bit. Probably pretty well timed because uh, you know, the Wonka movie's out soon. It's gonna really date this video, but we love Chalamet. These are pretty good. I do think it's like an interesting textural experience when you eat one of these, because it's the kind of chewiness of the jelly bean mixed in with the melty milk chocolate. Not my favorite, but hey, if you want something a little bit different, then this is for you. Then we're on to the Big Taste bars. This is the Dairy Milk Big Taste Oreo Crunch. I did mention that there was a theme of Dairy Milk and Oreo crossover products, and this is the next one in that line. So with the Big Taste bars, they are thicker than a standard chocolate bar would be. And because of that, they have like layers going on, basically double the height. So here is the standard Dairy Milk Oreo, and here is the Big Taste Oreo. As you can see, you get much more distinct layers on this one. I'm gonna be honest, I think I just prefer the standard one. <laughs> one iconic Cadbury product is the Freddo. A Freddo is a small individually wrapped chocolate bar that's in the shape of a frog. Now you can get two versions of this. You can either get a standard one, which is just milk chocolate, or you can get a caramel Freddo. Much like a dairy milk caramel bar, it's a shell of milk chocolate with that kind of liquidy caramel on the inside. I love Freddos. I feel like a lot of Brits have a nostalgic attachment to them. I can't tell if they've shrunk over the years or if I've just got bigger or possibly both. But I do feel like back in the day, when you're a little kid, these are a nice little like snack sized treat. Whereas nowadays, this is like a mouthful. This is kind of tiny. They're also worth pointing out because in the UK, they've become an unlikely economic yardstick. When I was a kid, they cost just 10 pence, but the price has risen drastically over the past few years. At one point in 2017, the price rose as high as 30p for one of these, whereas I think it's now dropped back down to 25 after probably a lot of public outcry. Because of the fluctuating price, they've kind of become a measure of inflation and cost of living here in the UK. People's paychecks do not buy them as many Freddos as they used to, and that is a sad thing. That's funny, Harry. And the US Careberry tried what I think are similar shenanigans by decreasing the size of the products. Back in 2007, US comedian and actor BJ Novak outed Cadbury on the Conan O'Brien show for suddenly making Cadbury eggs smaller. In the UK, we also have a couple of plant-based chocolate options. They're made with almonds instead of dairy in order to try and replicate a milk chocolate feel. And they come in two forms, either as a classic bar or as a salted caramel. It's actually not that bad. They've done really well, I think, to replicate the texture of milk chocolate, because as it kind of claims on the packaging, smooth, I think, is the word. It really is quite a smooth experience. It does kind of melt in your mouth, almost like a milk chocolate bar would. I think what's letting it down really for me is still the taste of it rather than the texture. It tastes almost more like a sort of uh, cooking chocolate or like, you know, when you get those really cheap chocolate chips and it just feels like there isn't enough cocoa or like creaminess to them. We have these four exclusive bars here in the US. We got uh, Rock the Road, which is milk chocolate with roasted almonds, marshmallows, and fudge. No, I don't like that. We have a royal dark, dark chocolate. I'm sure you have several dark chocolates. Ours is royal. I'm not a big dark chocolate guy. Not as bitter as I expect from dark chocolate, so not bad, but eh, I don't know. Again, just okay. Roasted almond. Mm. Generous with the almonds, right? It's a pretty good almond, pretty good almond haul. Last of our exclusive flavors are black forest cake, which is dark chocolate with cherry flavored fudge and cookie pieces. Oh man. Okay, so apparently in the UK, you would call this a black forest gato, which is funny because you didn't use the French words for black or forest. Well, I'm the black forest in Germany, so. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> and the black forest in Germany. The EU, you guys don't know what's going on. Uh, I'm gonna be honest with you, chocolate and cherry, not my favorite combo. Oh God, ugh. This is terrible. This is the worst one. Oh, I hate this. Ugh. Next up, we're onto buttons. Now, Cadbury buttons are just pieces of dairy milk chocolate shaped into little buttons or little discs. Buttons come in a range of sizes and flavors. So the original ones are actually tiny. I feel like they've kind of fallen out of favor or maybe you're just kind of only given to kids, but this is what, honestly, the classic button looks like. And it's these really tiny little chocolate discs. It's literally just plain dairy milk chocolate. The ones that I would more commonly go for in my adult life are the ones which are served in these big sharing bags. And they're more like this size. You say that's like, that's more than double the size, I would say. And then if that button size is still not big enough for you, then we have mega buttons. So we have classic, giant, and mega. Just one more note on the size of the buttons. We've observed that the classic ones on the packet are just called buttons. 
but what I think used to be called the giant ones are also now just called buttons, which you can see because they are still called giant buttons in the orange flavored version. You can also get buttons in a range of flavors. So here we have some mint chocolate buttons, some orange chocolate buttons. These ones are called caramel nibbles, but I always thought they were just caramel buttons because again, they're kind of the disc shape, but with a little pocket of caramel in the middle. And you can also get dark milk buttons. Now these are a Cadbury invention, which is somewhere between dark chocolate and milk chocolate, as well as caramel buttons. And if you want just actual dark chocolate, Cadbury's calls that Bourneville, and they have giant Bourneville dark chocolate buttons. Another Cadbury product in the UK are Cadbury Fingers. Now these are a classic. I feel like these are a staple in a lot of British households. Basically what you get is a layer of biscuit along the bottom, which is then kind of just completely dunked in Cadbury milk chocolate. Can't figure out exactly what the biscuit is. I think it's kind of like shortbread. You can also get Cadbury Fingers in a range of sizes and flavors. For example, you can get these little bite-sized pouches. We have the salted caramel fingers here, but you can also find white chocolate fingers, orange chocolate fingers, mint chocolate fingers, and dark. One thing which has just launched in the UK at the time of filming is Cadbury Delights. These are a new range of products which I believe are nougat covered in chocolate. These come in the flavors of hazelnut and caramel, orange and caramel, and salted caramel. Another exclusive we have in the US are the mini chocolate eggs, harvest eggs, but it's around the holidays right now, so we have instead mini snowballs. I feel like they're the same, these are the same, come on. Yeah, just milk chocolate with a uh, crisp sugary shell is this in here. Good for snacking, I think. Um, I think these are the taste the best out of everything here, to be honest. I also have the cream eggs. Couldn't find them anywhere. I thought they used to be everywhere. Now they're gone. I don't know what happened to them, but you know what they look like. We have them. Tragically, we're filming this in November, so we can't get our hands on our seasonal egg exclusives. Cadbury's is obviously known for cream eggs, but also has mini eggs, which I believe are excellent. In the UK, we can obviously get the classic cream egg, but we can also get white cream eggs and caramel eggs. We can also get classic mini eggs as well as a mini eggs bar. However, I will point out that because it's in the run up to Christmas, we are able to get Heroes right now, which is a Cadbury selection box typically eaten around the holidays. As part of a Heroes box, you can get a little bite-sized twisted cream egg bar. I get that like, you know, you wanna create that artificial demand, but I feel like people are gonna eat cream eggs year round regardless of availability. So I feel like you should just give the people what they want have cream eggs year round. Same for mini eggs. Please, I need those much more than cream eggs. Now we're onto some exclusive chocolate bars, which you'll find in the UK, but not the US. I'm gonna go through them in like a roughly alphabetical order here, starting with the Boost Bar. Now, I believe when these were first introduced, they were almost advertised as like an energy bar in chocolate form, because I think they had like mortifying levels of sugar and glucose in them. Whereas now I think they've actually dialed back on that, and it's kind of just like a chocolate bar with some biscuit and caramel in the middle. At the Boost Bar, give me the Boost. Mmm. Everyone in the UK has watched me like, this dummy's never had this before? No, I haven't. Or if I had, I don't remember it. Now you might remember from the buttons, but when you see dark chocolate in Cadbury's, it's gonna be marketed as Bourneville. Comes in this iconic red packaging as well, compared to the usual purple colors used by Cadbury's. Fun fact, Bourneville is actually a real town which you can visit in the UK. It was created basically by Cadbury to house all of their workers, and apparently it's quite a nice place to live. I'm not sure why they've ended up using that name for their dark chocolate range, but here it is. You can get it in a few different flavors. Here, for example, I have the Old Jamaica flavor, which is a dark chocolate with rum and raisin. We also have the Bourneville Mint Crisp bar. You can also just get it in a standard plain dark chocolate one, as well as an orange bar as well. Next up, we have Caramel. So as the name suggests, this is kind of like a caramelly milk chocolate hybrid, which Cadbury's has released over the past couple of years. What you end up with is this like slightly weird, yellowy, golden color. Kind of weird because it's got the texture of like a milk chocolate, but the flavor is much closer to like a buttery fudge. You can also get caramel in the form of a caramel crispy bar, which is caramel chocolate with little crisped rice pieces. Speaking of crunch, next up we have a crunchy bar. These are pretty iconic. Basically what you get is a honeycomb, which is then dipped in milk chocolate to produce a crunchy bar. When I say honeycomb, obviously there's no actual beehive in here. What you do is you mix melted sugar and I believe baking soda, and it kind of like aerates and puffs up and then solidifies to leave you with what we know as kind of, I guess like confectioner's honeycomb. Again, slightly controversial take. I don't like crunchy. I don't like the texture of the honeycomb on my teeth. It feels really weird and I don't enjoy it, but I know it's a very popular bar, so you do you, that's fine. Next up is another possible favorite of mine. It's a curly whirly. Now, I love these because it sounds like an American has kind of like 
improvised a name for a British chocolate bar. They're a little bit hard to describe. It's a combination of chocolate and toffee, but it's in this very distinctive, unique shape. I'm not really sure what the logic is behind the shape, but I'm not sure if the same distinction exists in America, but here in the UK, if we say something has toffee in it, that implies that it's gonna be very chewy. Kind of similar to caramel in terms of the taste, but a lot more chewy. Curly whirlies, let's go. I have had these before and I do really like them. Oh yeah. Mmm. Mmm. Yeah. Next up we have some more dark milk products. Again, this sits somewhere between dark and milk chocolate on the kind of cocoa content scale. This one is flavored with some little salted caramel pieces. More of the salted caramel. Again, with the salted caramel, we get it, it's fine. You might also be able to find the same bar, but flavored with some hazelnut praline pieces. Next up is another classic, it's a double decker bar. Our buses aren't the only things that are double decker here in the UK, we also have these chocolate bars. There's like quite a lot going on in a double decker bar. I do love them, I'm gonna be honest. But so what you get is obviously the dairy milk chocolate coating on the outside, but then on the inside, you see you have this big layer of nougat. And on the other side, you have lots of these little crispy, I think kind of like crispy rice pieces. Moving on from that, we have a flake. So I don't really understand how flakes are made, but they are quite impressive. Basically, I think what they do is they get like a kind of like waterfall of chocolate. And the way that it kind of like hits the refrigerated surface, it kind of like folds in on itself. And you get this really like layered flaky texture. Flakes are pretty iconic. The main use of flakes, arguably in the UK, is in ice cream cones. What you will usually get is a whipped ice cream cone, Mr. Whippy, and then they just stick a flake in there as well. Flakes have also apparently been the center of some uh, controversy this year, because due to the weird structure of them, they don't melt. Now, unlike most of the chocolate that I've been trying today, I've kind of come away with like little bits of melted chocolate on my hand, but basically due to how thin the layers of the chocolate are, when it melts, the solids and the fats don't really separate like they should do, and therefore it just can't melt. You can put one of these in like a bain-marie and it will just not melt. You can microwave one and it will just burn before it starts to melt. The fun facts don't stop there. We're rolling straight in to the fries chocolate cream. Woo. Now, obviously these do not have the same packaging, or branding as the rest of them, but they are indeed manufactured by Cadbury's. So these are bars of dark chocolate with a fondant cream center. They're worthy of special mention because these are some of the first ever mass produced chocolate bars. They take their name from the Fry family who were a Quaker family from Bristol in the UK. Now the Fry's were actually the first people to figure out how to make mass produced chocolate bars. We're going all the way back to the 1840s here in the UK, but around that time, people only really drank chocolate. It was quite rare to get like, you know, a piece of chocolate or a chocolate bar. The fries were the first ones who figured out how to press cacao beans to separate the fats from the solids. Now they were doing this just to try and make a drinking powder that was kind of easier to dissolve, but inadvertently figured out how to separate all the materials and then reincorporate them in order to make a shelf stable chocolate bar. That's a taste of history right there. This is the packaging, it's a fry chocolate cream. The packaging of this one is suspicious. It's like lowest effort of packaging. It's just this white text, no drop shadow. A little bit of the uh, the bar right there. No, I do not like this. Now, while they're not technically products themselves, rather an amalgamation of products, we have some selection boxes here in the UK, which are worth pointing out. Now, these will start to pop up in stores around Christmas time, which is when they're usually eaten. Now, these are what's known as a selection box. So basically, you have small individual versions of quite a few of their different chocolate bars, which you can then share with the family. So the box of heroes will contain eclairs, fudge, whisper, dairy milk, crunchy bits, twirl, dairy milk caramel, double decker, and the cream egg twisted. We also have roses, and these aren't really based on existing brands. These are more just like classic chocolate box selections, I suppose. So we have things like the orange cream, the strawberry dream. We do actually have some mini dairy milk bars in here now, as well as a few other ones. I feel like in my power rankings of all the chocolate selection boxes, I don't know if the Cadbury ones win for me. I do think Celebrations might win for me, which is like the Mars brand equivalent of these ones. I'm thinking it's probably Celebrations, Heroes, Roses. On oh, Quality Street, of course, the classics. Man, British Christmas, what a wonderful time. While we're talking about selection boxes, I should also mention the milk tray. Now these are a classic. These have been going back years and years and years. I feel like it's less of a thing now, but these were very, very popular to gift to people, whether, you know, someone's had you around for a dinner party or it's a birthday. Give someone a milk tray back in like the kind of 60s or 70s. It was just the dumb thing to do. 
Back to the chocolate bars. This is a picnic bar. I actually don't know if I've ever had a picnic bar before, mostly because they contain raisins. It's a milk chocolate bar, but then inside, it's kind of just like a mixture of everything. You get raisins, you get peanuts, there's crispy cereal in there. I think there's caramel as well. Next up is the Cadbury Timeout Wafer. I'd say this is more of a biscuit bar than a chocolate bar, but you have layers of biscuit and chocolate, which are then obviously coated in more Cadbury Dairy Milk chocolate. Then we're on to a 12. These are kind of similar to the flake in terms of the texture. It's kind of like flaked texture inside, but the actual individual bars are coated with chocolate. Twirl, what is a twirl? No, I don't like this. It's just okay. I, I, don't, like, I don't like the um, the airy texture of it. Man, these are a classic. I feel like these have almost gone extinct. This is a chomp bar. It's kind of the same as a curly whirly in that it's basically a layer of toffee covered in milk chocolate. But instead of that like weird patterning with the gaps, this is just a solid bar. I feel like these have always been served in this kind of small size bar as more of a snack maybe aimed towards kids. But I love a chomp, these are brilliant. Shh, it's a whisper bar. I don't fully understand whisper bars. I like them, don't get me wrong, but it just kind of like feels like you're getting less chocolate for your money than you are with some other bars. Because basically they've taken a milk chocolate bar, but they've figured out how to aerate it and kind of like put little air bubbles in. What they've really gone for is a texture where when you bite into it, it almost like melts on your tongue. We also have a Whisper Gold bar. Whisper Gold is the same aerated texture, but it has a layer of caramel running along the top. Next up, we have a Star Bar. Now, the way I see it, this is just like a better picnic bar. So a Star Bar is basically just milk chocolate on the outside, caramel and peanuts. Next up, we have the Fudge Bar. It's a layer of fudge with some Cadbury chocolate on the outside. They're still in the Heroes box, which I like, but I feel like not that many people like them anymore. And then finally, for the time being, Eclairs. So the Cadbury Eclair is very different to the pastry Eclair. It's basically a ball of toffee with chocolate on the inside. I always like these. Also, there's always something really satisfying about the texture of toffee to me. I had braces as a little kid and I really missed toffee when I had braces. So I'll never take toffee for granted again. Now Cadbury in the US is a brand that's manufactured by Hershey. So there's no sub brands under Cadbury in the United States. However, Hershey does own about 29 brands. Here are a few that are exclusive to the US. In no particular order, first one, Milk Duds, have been to movie theater in the US. Recognize that sound? Some jerk sitting two rows behind he doesn't understand, he's making noise. You got Milk Duds. Milk Duds are like curly whirlies in button form. Yeah, that's actually pretty good what I just did there. It is just caramel covered in chocolate, but it is in button form and not like drizzle form. These. Guaranteed stuck to your teeth. Guaranteed you're digging these out of your teeth. A Heath bar is, hang on, English toffee enrobed in rich chocolatey coating. They they wrote that like they thought an American would read that and be like, this is from England. Mounds is chocolate and coconut. There it is, it's a mound, looks a little bit like a rabbit turd. It's just a chunk of coconut covered in dark chocolate. Now, if you're looking at this and you're being like, it needs something else, Joe. Yes, it does. How about almonds? Almond Joy. The exact same thing as a mounds, but if said rabbit ate a bunch of almonds, whole coconut and chocolate, coconut, almonds and chocolate. Some of the bars are also available in the form of these bite-sized pieces. These come in bags. Notably, we have some crunchy rocks. We have bits of whisper. We have curly whirly squirlies and the least fun name, 12 bites. These are more designed to be shared than obviously a classic chocolate bar would be. I think the idea is maybe you get a bag of these, take it into the cinema or something, watch a film, get a little snack. Next up we have brunch bars. These are Capri's take on cereal bars. We've got these brunch bars in three different flavors. We have a raisin one, a milk choc chip one, and a dark choc chip one. I do actually quite like these. These were like a occasional packed lunch inclusion when I was growing up. Basically, it's a cereal bar made mostly with oats, but then you get this base layer of chocolate, as well as, in this case, some choc chips as well. Yeah, they've got like a nice chewy texture. And then finally, it's time for what we'll call the best of the rest. These are the kind of miscellaneous Cadbury products, which don't really fit into any of the other categories, but are still worth talking about. Firstly, we have animal biscuits. These were, again, like a classic packed lunch staple when I was younger. You get a little biscuit, which on one side is kind of like decorated in the shape of an animal, and on the other side is just dipped in dairy milk chocolate. Gotta give a shout out to Mini Rolls. These are another like maybe grandma biscuit tin staple. These are uh, actually like a cake basically, rather than a biscuit or a chocolate bar. 
It's a roll of chocolate sponge cake, which is then, like I say, rolled up with a little like layer of cream in the middle. And then the whole thing is dipped in milk chocolate as well. And then while we're talking about Cadbury cakes, we also have Cadbury cake bars. Kind of similar to mini rolls in that you have the chocolate sponge. It's all coated in chocolate as well, but you have that caramel layer along the top. Then we're on to a couple of fridge desserts. These are Cadbury's milk chocolate sticky puds. So these are great. I've had like these or an iteration of these many times in the past. Basically they come in these little plastic pots, which are microwavable. And the typical way to eat these is that you maybe pierce the film on this, put the whole thing in the microwave for 30 seconds, a minute or so, take it out, flip it onto a plate, and it comes out. Cooking it kind of like steams the sponge when it's in there. And then there's like a chocolate sauce, as you can see on the packaging, which is kind of collected at this end. And then when you flip it, ends up kind of like drizzling down the side of the puds. And it's very nice, like a fun, kind of like fancy feeling dessert that you can just have at home in 30 seconds. Pud, of course, is short for pudding, which is what we call dessert. And then we also have these dairy milk pots of joy. These are apparently a smooth and creamy dessert made with melted Cadbury milk chocolate. I've not had one of these before. I think they're like a yogurt, basically like a chocolate yogurt pot. I'm not sure what to make of this next one because it feels a little bit like America is infiltrating our Cadbury products. But this is Cadbury dairy milk fruitier and nuttier orange trail mix. These, I believe, are new. I don't think Cadbury's been doing trail mix for a very long time. I also don't think trail mix is very popular in the UK in general, like it's just not that common. So in a bag of this, apparently you get sweetened cocoa, dairy milk orange buttons, raisins and sultanas, roasted almonds and hazelnuts. Speaking of things meant to sound English, it's a York peppermint patty, all the way from the city of York. It is this, and it's just, instead of coconut, it is, uh, peppermint. Mr. Goodbar, chocolate and peanuts. This bar, the packaging, you can tell this is an old school bar. This bar is so old that its main selling point was like, we assure you there's peanuts in this bar. We're not lying to you, all right? Yes, you won't believe how packed with peanuts this bar is. Is this true to the, to the, the, get, the good bar guarantee on the back? Possibly more. Wow, they, they over delivered on the promise of peanuts. Fifth Avenue bar, I don't know what this is. Ugh. What am I call it? Let's go. Chocolate, peanut flavor, crisps, and caramel. Definitely very peanut buttery. Yeah, it's okay. We have two options when it comes to beverages for Cadbury's in the UK. Here we have original Cadbury hot chocolate, and then we also have Highlights milk choc drink. I'm not massively sure what the difference is, but I think just judging from kind of a look on the packaging, Highlights might be designed as kind of like a diet option, just because it's described as an instant low calorie milk chocolate flavor hot drink. Staying in the cupboard section of the Cadbury's aisle, now we're onto the chocolate spread. This is effectively kind of like a Nutella, but it doesn't have hazelnuts in it. So this is just like a pure chocolate spread. Now we're moving on to the bakery section of your supermarket. I got most of these from an Asda in London. So I do think the availability will vary slightly depending on where you are and which supermarket you're visiting. But I will say that most supermarkets will have a bakery section and you'll probably see some Cadbury branding in there somewhere. Here's what I was able to find. We have three of these bagged goods from the bakery at Asda range. Firstly, we have some OT Bakes which are oat flapjacks containing milk chocolate. Next up, we have some Cadbury Dairy Milk Shorty Squares. Shorties like a melody in my square. Shorty Squares are a short cake packed with, again, some dairy milk chocolate chunks. Then we have some Cadbury Dairy Milk Chocolate Cookies. We're staying in the bakery aisle. And now we're on to Dairy Milk Caramel Donuts. Now I'm kind of intrigued by these. I love donuts. It's just very dry. And then we have a few more baked goods, namely the Dairy Milk Caramel Mini Cookies, Dairy Milk Cornflake Cluster Bites, and some Dairy Milk Brownie Bites. Then we're gonna round things off with a few seasonal items. As I mentioned, unfortunately, we weren't able to get the Easter exclusives, which are pretty iconic, namely the cream egg and the mini egg. But because we're kind of in the Christmas Halloween period, I was able to get some of those exclusives instead. We'll start with the Halloween ones, which has just come and gone here in the UK but we were able to find some mini bonfire logs, which are fun. I think these are like a mini roll, but instead of the classic kind of chocolate sponge, they've used a honey honeycomb sponge instead. And then another spooky seasonal exclusive are the pumpkin patch cakes. These are chocolate cakes with an orange colored cream filling. 
Then we have some Cadbury Christmas puds. These are dairy milk chocolate balls with a hazelnut truffle center, hazelnut pieces, and rice crisps. Again, it's that combination of like chocolate and nuts, just can't go wrong for me. And of course, we can't talk about seasonal exclusives without talking about advent calendars. We love our advent calendars over here. Cadbury's, of course, has to get involved and they have a very simple but very effective chocolate advent calendar. This 110 gram bar of Cadbury Dairy Milk costs £1.35 at Tesco. Breaking that down, you're paying 1.22 pence per gram of chocolate. In the US, our bar is 99 grams and it costs $2.79, which is 2.8 cents per gram. So per gram, it's a 91% increase in the US. Ooh, getting gouged, baby. Here's everything in a bar of dairy milk chocolate in the UK. Milk, sugar, cocoa butter, cocoa mass, vegetable fats, palm and shea, emulsifiers, E442, ammonium phosphatides, E476, polyglycerol, polyricinoleate, and flavorings. Here's everything in a US dairy milk chocolate bar. We got sugar, milk, chocolate, cocoa butter, lactose, lecithin, PGPR, natural flavor, artificial flavor. UK chocolate is often considered as superior by some, including myself, to US chocolate. And there are a few reasons for that. Firstly, the UK rules for its chocolate production from the Cocoa and Chocolate Products Regulations of 2003 set minimums for milk chocolate at 25% cocoa fat, cocoa butter and milk fat, 5% milk fat, 20% dry cocoa solids, 2.5% dry non-fat cocoa solids, and 20% dry milk solids. In the US, our FDA rules for our milk chocolate differ quite a bit. 10% chocolate liqueur, 12% milk solids, which can be either powder or condensed milk, at least 3.39% fat, and no more than 55% sugar. Secondly, those of us on this side of the Atlantic can feel that American chocolate has a sour, almost vomity taste to it. That's all very well and good for American branded chocolate bars, but why doesn't US Cadbury taste like it does over here in the UK? It starts with the Hershey Company. Back in the early 1900s, the company introduced cost-cutting measures, including a process to make its milk last longer in production. For this, they used a secret method called liposis, liplosis, lipolysis. The details of Hershey's chocolate making process are a company secret, but part of the process involves butyric acid. Butyric acid extends the shelf life of milk, but it does partially sour it. It's also found in Parmesan cheese, fermented foods like sauerkraut, and of course, vomit. Hershey's became a powerful chocolate company in the US. So much so they successfully forced a ban on an import of Cadbury's chocolate into the US. In 1988, Hershey's acquired the U.S. Cadbury license and has been producing it in the U.S. with their own Americanized formula, putting them in similar looking Cadbury packages ever since. Remember the price section from earlier? Well, it turns out that not only are Americans paying basically double the price for their chocolate as we are, but they're also getting a worse quality product. That's kind of sad. 100 grams of dairy milk chocolate in the U.K. contains the following. 534 calories, 30 grams of fat, of which 18 grams are saturated, 57 grams of carbs, of which 56 grams are sugars, and 56 milligrams of sodium. Let's compare that to a 99 gram bar over here, seeing as there's only one gram difference. 500 calories, 57.5 grams of carbs, 27.5 grams of total fat, 17.5 grams of saturated fat, 55 grams of total sugars, 7.5 grams of protein, and 100 milligrams of sodium. If we compare the 100 gram stats in the UK to the 99 gram stats in the US, you'll find that the UK actually has slightly more calories and fat, although it has less carbs and much less sodium. What? I'm watching the current season of uh, Love Island, UK. So I'm like, are you joking? Are you joking? You're having a laugh? Are you having a laugh? This is journalism, baby. This is why we went to journalism school. I didn't go to journalism school, so I have an excuse. <laughs>